Hi, welcome to my presentation on chapter 18, the blood vessels. So we've got three basic types of blood vessels, arteries, capillaries, and veins. Arteries are always carrying blood away from the heart and veins are carrying blood back to the heart. So usually we think about arteries as carrying oxygenated blood and veins as carrying deoxygenated blood but that actually depends on if we're talking about um, arteries and veins in the systemic circuit or in the pulmonary circuit. Um, the actual definition of the difference between arteries and veins is that arteries are carrying blood away from the heart and veins are carrying blood back to the heart. Um, you have structural differences between arteries and veins and functional differences as well. Arteries are gonna have a higher pressure, a higher blood pressure in them and that is the location where you are controlling your blood pressure overall. In the veins, you have less pressure. Um, the veins are very compliant, which means that the walls of veins will stretch easily to accommodate extra blood. And that means that veins are able to serve as a blood reservoir, where you're basically sort of stashing extra blood if you have it. Um, so if you end up with too great of blood volume, you can kind of stick some of that extra blood in the veins and they will just stretch to accommodate the extra volume. Arteries cannot stretch that much, so they can't do that. Then between arteries and, and veins, we have the capillaries, which are the smallest blood vessels, and their function is to allow gas exchange with the tissues. So oxygen is going to diffuse out of capillaries into the tissues, and carbon dioxide is going to diffuse uh, from the tissues into the capillaries. Uh, if we're talking about um, capillaries in the systemic circuit, in the pulmonary circuit, it goes the opposite way. Uh, we never will have just one capillary by itself. Capillaries occur in interconnected networks called capillary beds. So a capillary bed is that network of capillaries um, that is providing a particular tissue with gas exchange. So in this diagram here, you have an artery coming away from the heart. Um, it'll branch into smaller and smaller arteries, and then you get into a capillary bed. Uh, you can see that the capillaries are all interconnected to each other with these complicated branching patterns. And on the other side of the capillary bed, you end up in veins um, that merge together to form bigger and bigger veins and will return that blood to the heart. Arteries and veins have three basic layers in the walls um, of those vessels. Um, just the relative sizes will be different between arteries and veins for each layer. So the three layers are the tunica intima, the tunica media, and the tunica, tunica externa, also called the tunica adventitia. Then the hollow space inside of a blood vessel is called the lumen. Um, actually, for any hollow organ, uh, that would include like the esophagus, blood vessels, um, well, any, all, any hollow organ, the interior, the, the space that makes the, up the interior is called the lumen in general. Uh, for the tunica intima, that is the innermost layer that is actually in contact with the blood, uh, and it has three subparts or sublayers within it. First, you have the endothelium, which is simple squamous tissue, so it's literally a single layer of cells. It's extremely thin. It's actually continuous with the endothelium in the heart, so it's that same layer of cells that lines all the blood vessels and the heart. Um, the role of the endothelium is to reduce friction, so blood can easily flow through the vessels, so it's a very smooth surface. It also secretes chemicals that regulate how blood is flowing through the vessels. So some of those chemicals will prevent inappropriate clotting, and some of them will uh, help regulate blood pressure. For instance, the endothelium can release nitric oxide, which causes vasodilation, and that would reduce local blood pressure. Um, just next to the endothelium, you have the subendothelium, or just superficial to the endothelium is the subendothelium, which is made of loose connective tissue. As you may remember from AMP1, every time or everywhere that you have simple squamous tissue, you're going to have loose connective tissue next to it. Um, then superficial to that, you have the internal elastic lamina, which is composed of dense regular elastic tissue. And as the name suggests, its function is just to give elasticity to the blood vessel so that 
It is able to expand with blood and then bounce back to its original size. So those are the layers of the tunica intima. Then superficial to that, you have the tunica media or media, um, which is mostly composed of smooth muscle. And that is the layer of the blood vessel wall where you're able to actually regulate vasoconstriction or vasodilation, um, which determines the size or the diameter of the blood vessel to a large extent um, and regulates blood pressure as well as vascular resistance. The smooth muscle is going to be innervated by axons from the sympathetic nervous system, which can cause it to contract. Um, superficial to that, in the tunica media, you have the external elastic lamina, which is also composed of dense regular elastic, similar to the internal elastic lamina, and it has the same function. Then finally, you have the tunica externa, also called the tunica adventitia, uh, which is composed of dense irregular con uh, connective tissue. And the basic role of it is to limit the stretch of the blood vessel so that it does not stretch too, um, too far uh, so that it would actually potentially rip. Um, so the tunica adventitia is just giving it that strength to resist uh, excessive stretch. Within the tunica adventitia or tunica externa, you also have the vasa visora, which is a network of blood vessels that are supplying the outer layers of the blood vessel wall with, with blood. Um, specifically, they would be su supplying the tunica externa and the tunica media. The tunica intima doesn't need a separate blood supply because it's right next to the blood that's flowing through the vessel anyways, so it's getting its blood supply um, there from that blood in the vessel. In the diagram, you can see those different layers. So here you have the sub uh, sorry, here you have the endothelium of the tunica intima. Um, the space inside of it is the lumen. And so you see it's just a single layer, a single layer of squamous cells. This um, kind of translucent wrapping around it is the basement membrane of that endothelium. So it's actually part of the endothelium. Um, then beneath that, or superficial to that, you have the subendothelium and the internal elastic lamina has the little holes in it. So all of this is the tunica intima. And then you get into the tunica media with its smooth muscle layer. You can see the sympathetic nervous system axons coming in to innervate that so it can constrict. Then superficial to that in the tunica media, you have the external elastic lamina. And um, on top of everything, you have the tunica adventitia or tunica externa of dense regular connective tissue. And then you can see the vas visora vessels coming in, penetrating the tunica externa, um, supplying it with blood, but also going underneath it to supply the tunica media as well. We have different types of arteries and different types of veins. Um, the biggest arteries are called elastic arteries. They're also called conducting arteries. They are found very close to the heart, so basically that would be the aorta and pulmonary trunk. Um, they have the highest blood pressure of any artery, and they're the thickest also in terms of their walls. Uh, especially their elastic laminae are extremely thick, which gives them that extra elasticity, which is really important. Since they're right next to the heart, um, they're receiving these loads of blood that come out from the heart with every cardiac cycle. And they need to be able to stretch to accommodate that extra volume of blood. If they don't stretch, they may burst. And if that happens, you will, you will probably die very quickly. Um, so they're very stretchy. They will stretch out and then importantly, they bounce back to their original size. When they stretch and bounce back, the bouncing back actually helps propel blood through the vessel. So it's almost like the artery is pumping blood a little bit itself just by stretching out and then bouncing back to its original size. Um, the smooth muscle layer in the elastic arteries is pretty small uh, comparatively, so they don't have very much ability to constrict, and you're not going to be regulating blood pressure or vasoconstriction using those elastic arteries. They're really just designed to get blood out of the heart safely. Then you have the muscular arteries, which are also called distributing arteries, um, because their job is to distribute blood around to the body. Um, so those are also big arteries, but a little bit smaller than the elastic arteries, and they're also a bit further away from the heart. So the elastic arteries would actually branch into muscular arteries. The 
the smooth muscle of the tunica media of your muscular arteries, as the name suggests, is very thick, and you're doing a lot of blood pressure regulation there um, with a strong ability to contract that muscle and change the size of the vessel. Then you have the little arteries, which are called arterioles. Um, so your muscular arteries are going to branch and branch until they form arterioles or branch into arterioles. The arterioles have very thin walls compared to the other arteries, and they're much, much smaller. Um, they actually do have a significant ability to regulate blood pressure, though. Um, they can contract their size a significant amount. And then finally, you have the metarterioles, which are the smallest arteries of all that lead directly into a capillary bed. So you would go from elastic arteries, branch into muscular arteries, branch into arterioles, branch into metarterioles, then the next vessel that the blood enters is going to be a capillary. Metarterioles have what's called a precapillary sphincter um, at the end of them, just before they branch into capillaries, which is just a ring of smooth muscle going around the artery that can contract to regulate how blood is flowing through that capillary bed. So the body can actually restrict blood from entering a particular capillary bed by contracting those precapillary sphincters on the metarterioles that lead into that capillary bed, um, which is very useful for regulating blood flow throughout the body. That way, for instance, if you are um, if you're cold, then you can uh, prevent blood from flowing through the skin. You can also conserve blood if you're kind of low on blood. You could conserve it. Um, for your more vital organs by restricting it from entering the capillary beds of the less important organs. Um, so in the diagram, we have a basic representation of the different types of arteries. First, the elastic artery, um, then the muscular artery, then the arterial. And metarterials are not shown, but their walls are basically the same as arterials. They're just smaller, and they have the precapillary sphincters. So the elastic arteries are the biggest. These are all shown as though they have the same um, thickness to the wall, but that's not accurate. The elastic artery is the thickest, then the muscular artery, then the arterial is much thinner. And you can kind of see that by looking at um, how many cells, smooth muscle cells, are shown in the tunica media, how many layers of those cells you have. Um, the elastic arteries are going to have really thick elastic laminae. Muscular arteries will have really thick smooth muscle compared to the other layers. Um, and then the arterioles just have everything very thin. You also have different types of veins. Technically, a vein is a large vein. <laughs> um, so most veins are going to be just considered veins. All the, all the veins of any significant size, that is, are just going to be considered veins. Um, they have a very large lumen compared to the size of the walls, which are, com which are thinner. Uh, so compared to arteries, compared to arteries, veins are going to have a larger lumen and a thinner wall. Um, they don't have very much muscle or very much elastic tissue in the walls, but they do have a very thick tunica externa or tunica adventitia uh, to prevent them from stretching too large with blood. Another feature of veins is that they have valves called venous valves um, periodically throughout the veins. Those valves are just to prevent blood from flowing backwards. It's actually a little bit difficult to get blood flowing through the veins because you have very low pressure in them. So in arteries, blood pressure is what's mostly driving the flow of blood, but in veins you have very little of it. So you have to rely on other mechanisms for driving the flow of blood. And the valves are basically there to ensure that once you make some progress on pumping that blood back to the heart, you don't lose it again. The blood can only fall back to the next vein. Um, it's especially important considering that in a lot of the veins, you are pumping blood up against the force of, of gravity to the heart. Um, the smaller veins are called venules, which have really thin walls. And then you have the postcapillary venules, which are coming directly out of a capillary bed. So your blood that's in a capillary is going to, as it leaves the capillary bed, it's going to enter a postcapillary venule, then it'll flow into a venule, then into a vein, and you'll go through progressively larger veins until the blood gets back to um, one of the great veins that's entering the heart. 
Um, the postcapillary venules are very similar to uh, to the venules. Um, they just have they're just a little bit smaller, and they also have vessel walls uh, where it's very hard to tell the different layers apart. They're actually so small that the different layers are kind of running into each other, and it's really hard to tell where one layer ends and the next begins, um, with the exception of the endothelium itself. So in the diagram here, you can see uh, veins compared to venules. Venules will have an extremely um, thin wall, postcapillary venules even more so. Then the veins um, have a very thick tunica externa, very little muscle in their tunica media, um, and they will also have these valves in them. And here's a valve seen from this side. So these valves are working similar to how the heart valves work. If blood is pushing on the valve um, from below, it's going to be pushing onto the seam and it'll go straight through. Um, then if it starts to fall backwards, it's going to be pushing onto the cusps of the valve and that will push that valve closed so that the blood cannot go back through the valve. Um, so a basic rundown of some differences between arteries and veins. Uh, arteries have a higher pressure, a higher blood pressure than what veins have. Veins have very low blood pressure. Arteries are going to have thicker walls than veins. Uh, veins have thin walls and they have a larger lumen. Um, in the walls of your arteries, you're going to find more smooth muscle to allow control over the diameter of the artery. Veins have very little smooth muscle in their walls, and you're, you can constrict it, but that's not, um, that's not a primary way to regulate vasoconstriction or vasodilation. That would primarily occur in the arteries where you have more smooth muscle. You also have more elastic laminae in the arteries. Um, since they're under greater pressure, they have a greater need to not only expand but bounce back um, to their original size. With veins, they don't have very much elastic laminae or the laminae that they have are very thin. So they're still able to expand normally, but they can't bounce back to their original size very much. And that um, the fact that they don't bounce back is actually what allows them to serve as that blood reservoir so you can kind of stick extra blood in there. If you do that in an artery, it's not going to work. The, the vessel will expand to accommodate it and then bounce back to its original size. Um, in general, for arteries, the thickest part of the vessel wall is the tunica media, whereas in the veins, it's the tunica externa, just to prevent it from stretching too big. Um, arteries are overall going to be less compliant than veins. That's because their walls are thicker um, and because of the greater amount of muscle they have in those walls. Whereas the veins with the thinner walls are going to be more compliant, less stiff, better able to stretch to accommodate more blood. Um, arteries are used to control blood pressure and blood flow, whereas veins are used uh, to basically um, act as a blood reservoir and stash, kind of stash extra blood that you may have um, that wouldn't uh, be able to fit in the arteries. Um, so we're not going to go through specific blood vessels. The only exception is the hepatic portal vein, which is part of the hepatic portal system. Um, so a portal vein in general is a vein that connects two capillary beds. Normally, you're going to have arteries, capillary bed, vein, and then back to the heart. With a portal vein, you have artery, capillary bed, vein, capillary bed, vein, back to the heart. There's not very many examples of those in the body. Um, you may remember uh, from ANP1, there's a portal vein um, between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. The most important portal vein, though, is, um, is the hepatic portal vein, which is connecting the capillary beds of the digestive system um, to the capillary beds of the liver, which I guess the liver is actually part of the digestive system, but um, it's connecting capillary beds that are coming from the, the intestines and the stomach and the pancreas um, back to the capillary bed in the liver. Um, there is actually one part of the intestine that um, does not drain into the liver this way, which is the lowest part um, right, right near to the rectum itself. So when blood is flowing through the stomach or through the intestines, um, it's going to be picking up food there 
or other substances that you've absorbed that you've eaten, anything that's being absorbed, you know, across the wall of the intestine and into your blood, it's going to end up in the blood in those capillaries. This, those capillaries drain into the hepatic portal vein, and that carries the blood with all of those absorbed substances to the liver, where it enters another capillary bed, the hepatic capillary beds. Um, and then after that, it's going to drain into another vein and be returned to the heart. The liver's job is to kind of detoxify things and metabolize them. So any substances that you've eaten that may, um, that may affect the functioning of your body, that are not just food, but may affect your body's function, like a drug, those are all, or a toxin, those are all going to be um, acted on or metabolized in the liver uh, to reduce the toxicity or reduce the effect that it has on your body and uh, just to make it easier to excrete those things. Um, and this is called the first pass metabolism. So any drugs that you eat, uh, you know, whether they be medicines or illicit drugs, they're going to go through the hepatic portal system um, after they're absorbed into your bloodstream and they're going to be detoxified in the liver before they reach the rest of your body. So before anything else happens, your liver has a chance to metabolize those drugs, uh, which in general should detoxify them and make them easier to excrete. Um, so this is very important. It protects you from toxins that you may accidentally ingest. It also affects uh, drugs that you eat, uh, like pharmaceutical drugs that you eat. Some drugs are going to be um, subject to extensive first pass metabolism, which means that the liver is going to metabolize them very aggressively, so that most of that drug is going to be metabolized by the time it gets out of those liver capillary beds and has a chance to hit the rest of your system. Um, so, so for those drugs, once that happens, they're not as effective anymore, um, which reduces the therapeutic benefit that you would get for them. So for a drug that is subject to extensive first pass metabolism, a lot of the time you need to either eat a really high dose so that enough of it makes it through the liver to still have the intended effect, or you would need to have a different way of ingesting that drug, not eating it. Um, but that's for some drugs, that's kind of a problem because the oral route is actually the safest route in general to take a drug in. The, um, the GI tract is the actual system in your body that's designed specifically for absorbing things from the environment into your blood. Um, so you can inject drugs directly into your bloodstream. Um, you could inhale them. Uh, there's different things you can do, but all of those routes are in general harder on those tissues that are being used for the root uh, because the tissue isn't designed for that. So your lungs aren't designed to absorb drugs. So they're designed to exchange gases. Uh, your veins are not <laughs> designed to have a needle puncture them and drugs enter them. That's uh, damaging for them. So in order to minimize damage to the body, the safest way to uh, intake some type of drug is by the mouth. Um, you also have some drugs that are actually benefited by this first pass metabolism. Those are called prodrugs. A prodrug is something that actually has no effect by itself. Um, and you eat it and it goes through the hepatic portal system into the liver capillary beds and the liver will then metabolize it to a drug that is actually an active drug. Um, a good example of this is codeine. Codeine actually has no effect on the brain at all. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't relieve pain by itself whatsoever. When you eat it though, uh, it is subject to first pass metabolism as a prodrug and it is actually activated to morphine. And then morphine affects your brain and relieves pain. So if you didn't have that first pass metabolism, codeine would not be useful as a drug at all. Um, so that kind of means that codeine is maybe less likely to be abused than other opiate drugs because you can't actually inject it and get any effect out of it. Um, the only way to get any effect out of codeine is to have it go through the first pass metabolism and be activated by the liver to morphine. Although, of course, it's still possible to abuse codeine. Um, in order to avoid the first pass metabolism for drugs that you would like to take uh, using that safe route, but um, the, first, the liver would destroy them in the first pass metabolism. You can also use the enteric route, which basically means putting it up the rectum into that part uh, 
of the large intestine where the capillary beds actually do not drain into the hepatic portal system. Um, so if you're taking a suppository, that's going to be um, going through your body in a way that you know things are designed to be absorbed. Uh, that's you know it's it's safe, um, and it's going to avoid the first pass metabolism. So for some drug that would be metabolized too much in the liver, that's a possible route of administration. So now we'll talk about hemodyna hemodynamics, which is basically how the circulatory system is functioning um, to maintain blood pressure and blood flow. So first we'll talk about uh, the difference between vascular resistance and blood pressure. They're very similar to each other, but in a way they're also the opposite of each other. Vascular resistance is the force that opposes the flow of blood through the blood vessels, whereas blood pressure is the force exerted by the blood on the vessel walls. So you could think of vascular resistance as being like the force that uh, the vessel walls exert on the blood, and blood pressure is the force that the blood exerts on the vessel walls. So in that way, they're similar. Uh, well, in that way, they're like the opposite. Um, but vascular resistance does determine blood pressure, so they end up being very closely related to each other. Vascular resistance is determined by the vessel diameter, the vessel length, the vessel compliance, and the blood viscosity. Uh, so the vessel diameter is basically the vasoconstriction or the vasodilation, just how big around the vessel is. <clears throat> Specifically, what matters there is how big the lumen is, or the space where blood can actually fit and flow through. Um, also, vessel length. Uh, the greater the length is, the greater the resistance is. It's hard to get something moving through a very long pipe than through a very short pipe. Um, the vessel length we usually don't think about too much because it doesn't change. Uh, it, you know, it changes as you grow from a child to an adult, but apart from that, it doesn't really change in general. And then you have the vessel compliance, which is just the ability of the vessel walls to stretch to accommodate additional blood. Um, and the diagram there is showing vessel compliance. So if you had vessels with no compliance at all and you injected fluid, extra fluid into them, you would have no change in the size of the vessel at all. That means you're gonna have a change in the pressure in there instead. If you had infinite compliance and you eject fluid um, into the vessel, the vessel wall is going to stretch um, as much as it needs to to accommodate that extra fluid. So however much you put, that's how much it's gonna stretch. Um, but your actual blood vessels will have finite compliance, which means that when you inject fluid into them um, or when extra fluid enters them, they will stretch and become larger, uh, but they will not do so infinitely. So you also will have some change in the pressure when you're adding extra fluid to the vessels. The more compliant the vessel is, the more it will stretch to accommodate that, ex that extra fluid. The less compliant it is, the less it will stretch, the more stiff the vessel walls are. Um, and then finally, blood viscosity, which is just how thick the blood is. So for vessel diameter, when that goes up, vascular resistance goes down. For vessel length, when that goes up, vascular resistance goes up. For vessel compliance, when that goes up, the, vessel, uh, the vascular resistance goes down. And for blood viscosity, when that goes up, the vascular resistance goes up as well. Um, in general, the vascular resistance is going to be highest in the arterioles. Uh, you have a lot of arterioles and they have a very small diameter, very small lumen, um, which means that they're going to have a higher resistance than the larger arteries have. So that means that when you're controlling vascular resistance, you're mostly doing that in the arterioles. So the other arteries do contribute to vascular resistance, but just not as much as the arterioles do. Um, we also distinguish between vascular resistance in the systemic circuit versus the pulmonary circuit. So you have systemic vascular resistance, or SVR, and then pulmonary vascular resistance, or PVR. Um, but we usually only talk about systemic vascular resistance because it's much larger than the pulmonary resistance. And that's just because the systemic vessels are much longer. The pulmonary vessels just go to your lungs and back, right by the heart and then back again the systemic vessels are going all over your whole body. So they're a lot longer than the pulmonary vessels are. And that means that the systemic circuit has much higher resistance than the pulmonary circuit has.
Another word for the SVR is the peripheral resistance or total peripheral resistance. So a lot of the time you might see it abbreviated as TPR for total peripheral resistance. Um, then blood pressure is going to be determined, be determined by the vascular resistance, also by the cardiac output, and by the blood volume. So when vascular resistance goes up, uh, blood pressure will also go up. That's like uh, one of those laws from physics when for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. So if the vessel walls are pushing harder on the blood, the blood is going to push harder back on the vessel walls. Um, for blood volume, when that goes up, blood pressure will go up. Just more blood in uh, the same volume of space will create greater pressure. Um, although the vessels are compliant, so they will expand their volume a bit to uh, accommodate that extra blood, they're not going to uh, necessarily expand as much as they would need to to keep the blood pressure completely constant. So increased blood volume will increase blood pressure. And then finally, cardiac output. When you're pumping more blood out of the heart into the vessels, then the pressure is going to go up. Um, the blood pressure also depends on your gender, your age, and your size. Uh, so in general, men will have a higher blood pressure than women. Older people will have a higher blood pressure than younger people, partly because their vessels are stiffer and less compliant. And bigger people will have a higher blood pressure than smaller people, partly because they have um, a longer distance for their vessels to travel. So they have greater vascular resistance, and then that increases their blood pressure. There's a variety of ways that we can measure blood pressure. Um, when we're measuring blood pressure, you, it's similar to vascular resistance. Usually we're only talking about blood pressure in the systemic circuit. So when you hear vascular resistance, we usually mean SVR or TPR. When you hear blood pressure, we usually mean systemic blood pressure and not just systemic, but the pressure in the systemic arteries, not the pressure in the systemic veins. So the pulmonary circuit is going to have a lower blood pressure than the systemic circuit due to the lower resistance, and then the veins will have a lower pressure than the arteries have. So we're usually just talking about systemic artery blood pressure when we talk about blood pressure. And these are all measures of blood pressure in those systemic arteries. So you have the systolic pressure, which is the pressure in the systemic arteries when the ventricles are in systole. Um, ideally, it would be between 110 to 120 millimeters of mercury. Then you have the diastolic pressure, which is the pressure during ventricular diastole uh, when they're relaxed, which would generally be between 70 and 80 millimeters of mercury. Um, so we'll usually use both those numbers. So you'll say like 110 over 70, that means systolic pr uh, blood pressure over diastolic blood pressure. Um, then you also have the pulse pressure, which you can calculate using the systolic and diastolic pressures. Uh, the pulse pressure is the amount of change in blood pressure that occurs um, across a cardiac cycle or due to the ventricular contraction. So to calculate that, um, you would just uh, subtract the diastolic blood pressure from the systolic blood pressure, just how much the blood pressure is changing between systole and diastole. Then finally, you have the mean arterial pressure, or the MAP, um, which is the average blood pressure during a cardiac cycle. Um, it's, not, it's not just a straight average, though. Um, you are kind of weighting, weighting the systolic higher than the diastolic. Oh, sorry, actually weighting the diastolic higher than the systolic, uh, because your uh, ventricles will be in diastole for longer than they're in systole. So you can calculate MAP using the equation, the diastolic blood pressure plus the systolic minus the diastolic over or divided by three. And you could simplify that to the diastolic blood pressure plus the pulse pressure divided by three. Um, so generally we like to use MAP as the best like single number representation of the blood pressure. In order to measure the blood pressure, you would usually use a sphygmomanometer and a stethoscope. Um, when you're listening uh, to the blood or the heart with a stethoscope, we call that auscultation. Um, the sounds you hear when you're listening are called the sounds of carotid cough. When you're listening to the actual heart, 
you would be hearing, um, you know, the heart valves, the S1 and S2 sounds. But when you're listening to um, the blood flowing through the vessels, like in the arm where you would take the blood pressure, that's the sounds of Korot cough. And it's actually a bruit, which is the special name for a sound that's made by blood um, hitting the walls of a blood vessel. So when you hear a sound of blood hitting the walls in the heart, that's called a murmur. When you hear the sound of blood hitting the walls of the blood vessel, that's called a bruit. And the specific ones that you're listening to when you're trying to measure the blood pressure are the sounds of Korot cough. So you would be listening with your stethoscope um, you're going to use the cuff of the sphygmo manometer to create pressure um, on the arm and that's going to cut off circulation and then you're going to slowly release the pressure and you're just going to notice first when you start hearing those sounds and when you stop hearing those sounds as well. When you start hearing the sounds, that's the first point at which the blood pressure is sufficient to push blood through um, the vessels even though you are still squeezing them with the cuff. And then when you stop hearing, uh, so that's the systolic pressure, then when you stop hearing the sounds um, at all, that's when blood is now flowing smoothly, um, and that's the diastolic pressure. Um, you can actually feel that in your arteries. You can feel the pulse of your arteries. Um, and that is actually due to the arteries expanding and then bouncing back um, in time with with uh, well, basically in time with the heartbeat, in time with blood being injected from the heart and entering this extra bolus of blood, entering the blood vessels. So if the vessels are not compliant, then they're not going to expand and you're not going to feel them expand. If the vessels are not elastic, then they're not going to bounce back to their original size and you're not going to feel um, that pulse go away. Um, so you need both the compliance and elasticity to actually feel the pulse. So here's a summary of the things that affect blood pressure. Uh, so first we have the peripheral resistance or systemic vascular resistance. That's determined by the vessel compliance. When vessel compliance goes up, resistance goes down. It's also determined by the vessel radiance or diameter, which is basically the vasoconstriction or vasodilation. Um, here we're looking at an artery versus a vein. You can tell the artery has the thicker wall and the vein has the bigger lumen. Um, so when the vessel radius or vessel size goes up, um, then peripheral resistance will go down as well. Then we have the blood viscosity. And that's frequently affected by how much uh, plasma is in the blood versus how many cells or formed elements are in the blood. If you have less plasma and more formed elements, the blood is going to be thicker and more viscous. Uh, when viscosity goes up, resistance will go up as well. Then you have the blood vessel length. That would basically be constant. Um, when the vessel length is longer, peripheral resistance will go up. Uh, and then finally, if you have something going wrong with those vessels, like there's an obstruction, that's going to affect the peripheral resistance as well. Um, it's going to increase it. Basically, it's decreasing the size of the lumen, which increases the resistance. So normally, if you're healthy, it'll be these four things that affect it, the compliance, the radius, the viscosity, and the length. But if you have some obstruction in your vessels related to a disease, that is also going to increase the resistance. Um, and then increased resistance increases the blood pressure. Um, next, you have the cardiac output that also affects blood pressure. The two things that determine cardiac output are the stroke volume and the heart rate. So how many times the heart beats in a minute and how much blood is ejected from the heart with every heartbeat. Those two together determine the cardiac output. Uh, when either of those goes up, cardiac output goes up, and when cardiac output goes up, blood pressure goes up. Then stroke volume itself, as you remember, is determined by the preload, the afterload, and the contractility. And then the afterload is determined by the resistance and the blood pressure. So it's like a little circle. Um, and then finally, blood volume affects blood pressure as well. The more blood you have volume-wise, the higher the pressure will be. Uh, and that's mostly determined by the kidneys and by how much you're drinking. So, of course, when you drink water, that increases your blood volume. And when you pee, that decreases your blood volume. Um, and your, your, your kidneys will also be regulating how much uh, urine you produce um, mm -hmm. in order to balance that with how much you're drinking. So you have the right blood volume and the right blood pressure.
Um, it's good to notice that when your blood volume goes up at first, it's not going to really have a significant effect on blood pressure because you actually have a place to stash that extra volume, which is the veins, which serve as the blood reservoir. So when blood volume increases by a small or moderate amount, um, that's not going to affect blood pressure. It's just that the veins are going to stretch um, and accommodate that extra blood. Uh, if you continue having gains in your blood volume, then you're going to see uh, the gains in your blood pressure as well. And, and vice versa, if you lose some volume from your blood, just a small amount of volume, then that's just going to come out of whatever blood you had stashed in that blood reservoir you're keeping in your veins. And so your blood pressure will remain relatively stable unless you're losing a significant quantity of volume from your blood. And then the pressure is going to drop. So this graph is showing how blood, cha uh, how blood pressure changes throughout the um, different parts of the circulation, first uh, in the systemic circulation and then in the pulmonary circulation. So you start out at the aorta with really high blood pressure as the blood is just emerging from the heart. And you see these peaks are the blood pressure when the ventricles are in systole and they've just ejected or they are ejecting blood into the aorta. Um, and then these troughs are ventricular diastole when the ventricles are relaxed and you have less pressure in the aorta because no more blood, no extra blood is being uh, forced into it. Um, then from the aorta, you branch into the large arteries. Um, most of those are going to be muscular arteries. The ones that are branching directly off of the aorta are actually elastic arteries and the rest of them are muscular. Um, so you also have a very high blood pressure there. Um, and then when you get into the smaller arteries, the smaller muscular arteries, the blood pressure is going to start dropping. When you get into the arterioles, it's dropping even more. It's dropping quite a lot. Um, by the time you get to the capillaries, you have a lot less pressure left. Um, and by the time you get to the other side of that capillary bed, most of the pressure is gone. Um, and the venules have a very low pressure. And then when you get into finally into your actual veins proper, you have almost no pressure in them at all. And that situation persists through the small veins, the large veins, even the vena cava. Um, and then the blood goes back into the heart here. Um, we would be going back into the right side of the heart. So now it's going to be entering the pulmonary circuit. It picks up some pressure in the heart uh, due to the contractions of the heart. So your pulmonary trunk and pulmonary arteries are going to have um, a higher pressure than the rest of the, well, then a higher pressure than the veins, but you can see the pressure is much lower than it is um, in the aorta. So the pressure of the arteries coming out um, of the right side of the heart is much less than the pressure in the arteries coming out of the left side, uh, which is partly because the ventricles don't contract as strongly um, on that side of the heart. Uh, they don't have to push the blood as far, so they don't need to contract as strongly. They don't need to create as much pressure. And you can still see those, those peaks and troughs emerging again in the pulmonary arteries uh, when the ventricles are in systole versus in diastole. Um, those pulmonary arteries are going to travel the, to the lungs. Then you start branching into arterioles, and the pressure is decreasing again now, um, decreasing again uh, across the capillaries of the pulmonary circuit in the lungs. And by the time you get to those pulmonary venules and then into the pulmonary veins, you're again almost at zero. So the reason why the blood pressure is changing like this um, is because the resistance is changing of these different vessels. Wherever you have really high resistance in a vessel, you're going to have a lot of blood pressure. Um, it's also going to be hard for blood to move through that vessel. So you're not going to have kind of as quick or as much of a blood flow coming out the other side of that vessel. So the pressure afterwards, after the high resistance vessel, is going to be lower. Um, and that's basically the reason why your blood pressure is dropping as you reduce the size of the vessels and then move into the veins um, in both circuits. Another thing to notice here is just that the systemic circuit has much higher pressure than the pulmonary circuit in terms of the arteries. The systemic arteries specifically have a much higher pressure than the pulmonary arteries. Um, and that the veins of either circuit have very little pressure at all, almost none. So now we'll get into how blood is actually flowing through those vessels. So we've got a couple terms uh, that describe that. First, blood flow, then blood velocity. 
The blood flow is the actual volume of blood that is flowing through the vessels in a minute. Um, in general, it should be similar to the cardiac output. The flow needs to be roughly constant um, as a whole. In order to maintain a constant cardiac output, you have to have the blood that comes out of the heart coming back in at the same rate that it leaves, basically. Um, then you have also blood velocity, which is the speed at which the blood is moving through those vessels. So those things are related, but they're actually quite different um, in, in certain situations. The blood flow for arteries is driven by the blood pressure gradient, um, which means that blood is going to flow from an area of high blood pressure to an area of low blood pressure. Um, and that gradient is created by uh, the interaction of blood pressure with vascular resistance. So if you had um, a high pressure in your large arteries and you also had a high pressure still in your arterioles and it didn't drop off very much, that's not a very big gradient. It's actually the gradient that's driving the flow of blood. So if your blood pressure is not dropping off as the vessels get smaller, then there's nothing to encourage the blood to flow. Um, another thing that is going to affect the flow of blood is the vasoconstriction. Um, whenever you have a more vasoconstricted artery, then blood flow is going to drop, which makes sense because there's just less space there for blood to fit. So the volume of blood that's going through is going to go down. Um, so when you have vasodilation, that increases blood flow. Vasoconstriction decreases blood flow. So it's, it can be a little bit confusing because vasoconstriction increases blood pressure but it decreases blood flow. Vasodilation increases uh, blood flow, but it decreases blood pressure. Um, so whenever your body is trying to increase blood flow to a particular organ, it's going to dilate the arteries that are leading to the capillary beds for that organ. That increases blood flow. At the same time, though, it's going to decrease the blood pressure. Um, and of course, that only applies if you have enough force uh, to drive the blood through the vessels at all. Um, so that would be that blood pressure gradient. So you have to have the blood pressure gradient driving blood through the vessels, and then the size of the vessel will determine how much blood is flowing through it. Um, for the veins, the situation is very different for blood flow. Uh, you don't have a big blood pressure gradient. You're starting out with just above zero blood pressure and you're ending at zero, almost zero, basically, blood pressure. So there's a very small blood pressure gradient between the venules and the big veins going back into the heart. So that's not enough to drive blood flow. You need something else. Um, what you have for veins that drives the blood flow is the skeletal muscle pump, the respiratory pump, and vasoconstriction. So for veins, when you constrict them, uh, the blood pressure will go up, um, and that can actually give you some, some type of a gradient, some type of blood pressure gradient that can encourage blood to flow a bit. Um, also very helpful in the veins and very important is those valves, those venous valves that prevent the backflow. If you don't have them, you're not going to be able to, to effectively cause blood to flow through the veins. Um, you'll just get it going a little bit, and then it'll fall back. So we'll go through, we'll go over the skeletal muscle pump and the respiratory pump um, in a moment here. So now blood velocity, the speed with which blood is flowing when it flows, that is mainly determined, uh, determined by the cross-sectional area of the vessels that it's going through. Um, the cross-sectional area means if you were to take a circle slice through the lumen of a vessel and take the area of that circle, that is the cross-sectional area. When we're figuring the cross-sectional area, we're also adding up the, the cross-sectional area for every vessel of that type. So that means that when we're talking about the big elastic arteries, the aorta, you don't, you know, use basically just the cross-sectional area of the aorta plus its branches. But when we're talking about the arterioles, that means the cross-sectional area of every arteriole added together, and you have a lot. When we're talking about the capillaries, it's even more capillaries than arterioles. So that's the cross-sectional area of every little capillary all added up, and it's quite a lot. So every individual arterial does not have a big cross-sectional area. Every individual capillary does not have a big cross-sectional area. They're very small, but you have so many of them that when you add all of that together, you're ending up with a very big number. And since the blood is branching 
um, is flowing through these arteries that are branching into all of these arterioles and all of these capillaries. It's going to end up flowing through all those arterioles and all those capillaries at the same time. So the cross-sectional area of every single one is contributing to the total cross-sectional area of the space that the blood is flowing through. When the cross-sectional area goes up, blood velocity goes down. So when, when the size of the vessel is going up, the blood flow should go up if there's enough driving force, but the velocity of it is going to go down, um, which makes sense if you figure, if you remember like a river, a lazy river versus a river with rapids. Wherever you have rapids at a river, you usually are going to see that the banks get narrower, narrower or closer together. So when the river is narrow, you're going to have faster flow. But when you think about a lazy river, um, the banks are very far apart, right? That's a broad river that's moving slowly. So when the water has a smaller space to fit in, it's going to move faster. When it has a larger space to fit in, it's going to move slower. Um, so this, this graph here uh, is showing you the cross-sectional area uh, compared to the blood pressure and the blood velocity in the arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, and then veins. So Similar to that graph we just looked at on the previous slide, your blood pressure is starting out real high in the arteries, it starts decreasing the arterioles, it's pretty low in the capillaries, it's very low in the venules and the veins. Um, the blood velocity is going to be relatively high in the arteries and this starts decreasing. And when you get into the capillaries, it's like it drops off a cliff. It really slows down a lot. And then it actually starts picking up a bit once you get into the venules and the veins. And that's because of that cross-sectional area. So the cross-sectional area is this line here. It starts out very low in the arteries, in the big arteries. Um, when those arteries start branching to make smaller arteries, since there's so many of the small arteries, the cross-sectional area of all of them adds up. All of those arterioles are going to have their cross-sectional area add up. Um, and so the total cross-sectional area of the arterioles is starting to go up. It's bigger than for the arteries. When you get into the capillaries, there's really just so many of them that the total cross-sectional area of all of them is very high. And then it starts dropping again when you get into the venules and is very low again in the veins. So that increase in the total cross-sectional area of the capillaries corresponds perfectly to the drop in velocity of the blood as it's moving through the capillaries. Then when the cross-sectional area um, starts, uh, starts decreasing for the venules and the veins, then you start to see the blood velocity going back up. It does not get as high in the veins and the venules as it was in the arteries and the arterioles, and that's because you have less blood pressure in those venules and veins than the arteries and arterioles have. So the blood pressure is also affecting velocity somewhat. If you have, like, let's say, no blood pressure, uh, the implication there is no blood flow, uh, which would mean no velocity to the blood. So more blood pressure is generally also going to increase the velocity of the blood. And then this image here is just showing um, how those arteries branch and branch into arterioles and then into capillaries. So the blood is flowing through all these little capillaries simultaneously. So each single one is contributing to the cross-sectional area and that's why it gets so high in the capillaries. So now for the skeletal muscle pump and the respiratory pumps that are really crucial for driving the flow of blood in the veins where you don't have a blood pressure gradient of any significance. Um, so the skeletal muscle pump is mostly operating in your limbs, your arms and your legs. The respiratory pump is for your torso, um, the thoracic and abdominal pelvic cavities. Um, so the skeletal muscle pump basically just means that as your veins are traveling through your arms and legs, a lot of them are traveling through muscles because those arms and legs are basically, what are they? They're, they're bone surrounded by muscle and then with some skin on top. That's basically all that they've got to them. So most of those veins that are going through the limbs are traveling through a muscle. Uh, when the muscles contract, that's going to squeeze the veins and it pushes the blood through the veins. So here you can see this person clenching their calf muscles um, and that is squeezing the veins traveling through those muscles shut. And that means that all the blood um, that is just above this point where it's contracting is getting pushed up. It's getting pushed up. The blood that's just below where it's contracting is actually getting pushed down, but it runs into a valve um, and then that's it. 
Then when the uh, muscle relaxes, um, any blood that didn't make it through the next valve is going to pull back down to the first valve, but it can only go so far down. So this uh, skeletal muscle pump is really important for delivering blood back to the heart through the veins. Um, if it's not operating and you're standing, you are not going to be able to get blood up, up all the way from your foot back to your heart, uh, pumping it against the flow of gravity with no skeletal muscle pump helping you out. And that's actually the reason why if you stand perfectly still for too long, you will pass out. And it doesn't actually matter how um, what type of shape you're in. Any person, if they stand perfectly still for too long, they will pass out because you're not operating your skeletal muscle pump. Um, so related to that, if you are kind of standing and you notice yourself feeling faint, well, of course, it might be good to sit down. <laughs> but if you cannot sit down for any reason, then what also can help is if you start kind of shifting your legs around and contracting those muscles in your legs, that's actually going to help pump blood back up to your heart. Um, a final thing to note about the skeletal muscle pump is that it doesn't work as well in the superficial veins. Uh, those are the veins that are very close to the surface um, of, your, of your skin or of your body. So they're actually not necessarily embedded in a muscle. They might be running along the surface of a muscle. Uh, and so they're not going to be squeezed when the skeletal muscles contract. And so the skeletal muscle pump doesn't really help blood flow through those veins. Then in your torso, you have the respiratory pump operating instead. Um, it's mostly important for uh, those vessels that are beneath the layer, uh, the level of the heart. Um, it's less important for that little part of your torso, like at your upper chest area, where the veins are actually going to be above your heart. So the stuff that's returning in the superior vena cava um, doesn't need the respiratory pump quite as much as the stuff that's returning in the inferior vena cava. Um, the respiratory pump is based on the changes in volume and pressure in your thoracic and abdo abdominal pelvic cavities uh, that occur when you breathe. So we're actually going to go over this in, uh, in the next chapter on the respiratory system. But when you're inhaling, what happens is that your diaphragm contracts and it pulls itself down and the volume of your thoracic cavity goes up. When the volume of a cavity goes up, that means the pressure goes down, and then air will come into your lungs from the, from, you know, from the atmosphere. Whenever that's happening, if the volume of your thoracic cavity is going up, that means that the volume of your abdominal pelvic cavity is going down. When the volume of a cavity goes down, the pressure goes up. So when you breathe in, Thoracic volume goes up, abdominal pelvic volume goes down, pressure, thoracic pressure goes down, abdominal pelvic pressure goes up. Then in your abdominal pelvic cavity, for all the veins traveling through there, when that pressure goes up, they're getting squeezed by the extra pressure. And when they get squeezed like that, blood will be pushed through them. It'll be pushed up through them, um, you know, hopefully through to the next valve. Uh, then when you exhale, the opposite things happens. Your diaphragm is going to relax. Um, it travels back to its normal position. The thoracic cavity has its volume go down. That means its pressure goes up. That means that air is expelled out uh, of your lungs into the atmosphere. And the opposite thing is happening in the abdominal pelvic cavity. The volume of your abdominal pelvic cavity is going up when your thoracic cavity volume goes down. And the pressure in the abdominal pelvic cavity is going to go uh, down when the, when the volume goes up. So now those veins that are in your abdominal pelvic cavity are relaxing. The blood is going to fall back to the, next, to the first valve that it hits. Um, meanwhile, the veins that are in your thoracic cavity, they're the ones that are being squeezed now with the higher pressure in your thoracic cavity. So the blood there is going to be pumped up. So that's a pretty lengthy explanation, uh, but that's kind of shown here in these diagrams. Um, this one is for inhalation, um, and then on the uh, right side you have exhalation. So when the diaphragm is relaxed, it forms this dome that pushes up into the thoracic cavity. When it contracts, it flattens out. That increases the volume of the thoracic cavity, decreasing the pressure, but it also 
decreases the volume of the abdominal pelvic cavity, which increases the pressure, pushes on these veins, and pushes the blood through. So when you're inhaling, your abdominal pelvic blood is going to be flowing. Um, when you exhale, the diaphragm relaxes. It um, starts, you know, it goes back to its original position, kind of uh, curving up into the thoracic cavity. That means that the thoracic cavity volume goes down. The abdominal pelvic cavity volume goes up and pressure will go down in the abdominal pelvic cavity and it'll go up in the thoracic cavity when that thoracic volume goes down. So now it's the thoracic veins that are getting squeezed and blood is being pumped in the thoracic cavity instead. So inhalation, abdominal pelvic blood is moving. Exhalation, thoracic blood is moving. Ooh, okay, so now more on blood flow. We've got two basic types of blood flow. It can either be laminar, which is smooth, or it can be turbulent, which is like churning with eddies and like whirls and swirls. In general, you would like to have laminar flow nice and smooth, um, but sometimes you end up with turbulent flow instead, which uh, could be normal. It could be also a result of a disease state like an obstruction uh, in your veins uh, or in your vessels, and you know it, it over time can be bad for you. So with laminar flow, um, which is shown in the diagram here on the bottom, just smooth flow, where you have like these streams of blood just moving smoothly next to each other, just straight, smooth, everything hunky-dory. Um, with that type of flow, which is the normal type of flow that you would have in your vessels, the blood that's by the walls is going to be moving slower because it has a little bit of friction with the, wall, with the walls. Even though the endothelium is smooth to reduce friction, you can't reduce it all the way to zero. So you still have a little and you have slower flow there and faster flow in the middle. Of course, in your vessels, you would not have a circular object just right in the middle of the vessel. With the uh, turbulent flow, on the other hand, um, that's going to occur uh, not because you have a little circle in your vessel, but it'll occur because your vessels are branching or because you have some type of obstruction in there, uh, maybe a clot or a plaque. Um, when the blood is going around that obstruction or going uh, past that branch, some of it is going to be disturbed. The laminar flow is going to be disturbed and you're going to end up with these little eddies and whorls and stuff. Um, and eventually, as you go down, the laminar flow will reestablish. When you have this turbulent flow, that is going to increase resistance and decrease flow and velocity. So when the blood is flowing in a little circle like this, it's not going down vessel very efficiently, so it's not flowing as much. Um, and it's also going to be flowing uh, overall slower uh, if you consider how long it takes to get from point A here to point B over here, since it's not taking a straight path. Um, you can also have your blood hitting the walls of the vessels, uh, which you, you could actually hear that. Um, if that's happening in your vessels, that's called a bruit. The noise it makes is a bruit. If it's happening inside of your heart, the noise it makes is a murmur. Um, and the force of that blood hitting the walls of the vessel over time can stress the walls and cause damage to them. So it's not like an emergency or anything like that. Um, you know, it's every time the blood hits the vessel walls, it's very small amount of stress that it causes. But when this is going on day after day after day after day for a very long time, it can really start to add up and actually inflict damage on the vessel walls. Okay, so now we'll talk about how blood pressure is controlled by the nervous system and the endocrine system. First, the nervous system. The nervous system only controls blood pressure in the short term, so it does not make long-term changes to blood pressure. It makes changes that occur in, within minutes. Um, you have the two branches of the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, and they both can control blood pressure in opposite ways, essentially opposite ways. Um, so the sympathetic nervous system is able to increase the cardiac output, and it does that by increasing the heart rate and by increasing contractility, which then increases stroke volume and increases cardiac output. Um, so you can see that in this diagram here showing um, in orange sympathetic axons traveling to the heart, some of those axons are going to the SA node. Those would be the ones that are increasing heart rate, and the rest of them are going to the rest of the myocardium, 
uh, and just contacting um, contractile cardiomyocytes. Um, when those axons start firing, it's going to increase contractility, increasing the force of contractions of the heart, therefore increasing stroke volume, and therefore increasing cardiac output. Then when cardiac output goes up, blood pressure will go up. The sympathetic nervous system can also increase blood pressure by increasing the systemic vascular resistance, uh, the SVR or the TPR. Um, and it does that by causing vasoconstriction. So this is actually showing the different parts uh, or the different types of vessels that are contacted by sympathetic axons. So you have them going to the tunica media in the arteries, in the arterioles, not really in the venules, just a tiny bit, and in the, uh, the veins. It doesn't contact the capillaries, but the capillaries actually don't have a tunica media. They really just have the endothelium. Um, so the sympathetic nervous system is able to constrict all of those types of vessels. And when that happens, um, vascular resistance will go up and therefore blood pressure will go up. Actually, it doesn't uh, just constrict all of the blood vessels in, in the body um, kind of the same way. Um, it will constrict certain vessels that are serving certain organs and it will dilate, actually dilate other vessels that serve different organs. Um, so you may remember which ones it constricts and which ones it dilates from AMP1. The ones that are constricted by the sympathetic nervous system are the vessels that serve the digestive system, the reproductive system, the urinary system, the integumentary system, and most of your uh, exocrine glands. So those systems, digestive, urinary, reproductive, integumentary, which is a skin, those are the systems that you generally would not need for an emergency response to some sort of um, imminent danger. Uh, the vessels that will dilate in response to sympathetic nervous system activity are the ones that serve the skeletal muscles and the heart. So those are the vessels that serve organs that you really need to have a good blood supply and be active um, to help you respond to an emergency. So um, even though the sympathetic nervous system is not constricting all vessels, it's still constrict constricting a lot of vessels. Um, Right, the digestive, urinary, reproductive, and integumentary systems, those, that covers a lot of ground. So that's a lot of vessels that are being constricted when the sympathetic nervous system activates. Uh, and that means that overall, you are going to have an increase in vascular resistance when the sympathetic nervous system is active. Um, and that is going to increase your blood pressure. So we actually call that uh, constriction of those blood vessels in response to the SNS, vasomotor control. Vaso there means vascular for the blood vessels, and motor means that they are uh, moving by changing their size. So vasoconstriction or vasodilation in response to sympathetic nervous system stimulation, that is vasomotor control. And you actually have the sympathetic nervous system sending some action potentials along those axons to those blood vessels uh, to constrict them somewhat at rest. And that is absolutely necessary for your survival to maintain your, re your regular normal blood pressure. So that's what's being shown in this diagram here. So here you are at rest. Here's a sympathetic nervous system neuron um, sending its axon out to a blood vessel. This would be some type of artery, most likely. Um, and here you have the action potentials that are going along this axon. When they reach the end, you're going to have norepinephrine released as a neurotransmitter, and it causes uh, the vessel to constrict. So here, this vessel is actually partially constricted. You have kind of a moderate pace of action potentials being sent along this axon and a moderate or medium constriction in the vessel. Um, and then the sympathetic nervous system can either be activated and send more um, action potentials, or it could be inhibited and send less. So if you activate your sympathetic nervous system, you're gonna start sending a lot of action potentials along this axon, and you're gonna get a lot of vasoconstriction in this vessel. It's gonna get very small. Um, assuming that this is a vessel uh, that is serving the digestive, urinary, reproductive, or integumentary systems, or most exocrine glands, um, with the exception of the sweat glands. On the other hand, if your sympathetic nervous system was inhibited and you send fewer action potentials down this axon, then the vessel is going to dilate 
um, this medium amount of vasoconstriction is going to go away and you're going to have vasodilation. The vessel will get kind of as big as it can get with all those muscles in the tunica media relaxed. Um, if this happens to you uh, and you're kind of at rest and this happens to all of your blood vessels in the digestive, urinary, reproductive, and tegumentary systems, um, you will not have enough blood pressure to maintain blood flow in your arteries and that means that you will not have blood flow and you will, you will die. So it's very important that your sympathetic nervous system always keeps your blood vessels a little bit contracted or a little bit constricted at rest. It also gives you somewhere to go, right? If, they, if your vessels were always maximally dilated, then it wouldn't be possible to dilate them, actually. You would only be able to constrict them. So when you have them kind of medium or uh, moderately constricted, you can either go tighter or you can go looser. You have a place to go in both directions. The parasympathetic nervous system in general does the opposite of the sympathetic, um, but there are some kind of differences in the specific ways that it's affecting the blood pressure. So the sympathetic nervous system is increasing blood pressure, parasympathetic is decreasing it. But the way it does that is a little bit different. So it is going to affect cardiac output, decreasing the cardiac output, but only by decreasing heart rate. The parasympathetic nervous system does not affect contractility. And you can see that in this diagram here. In green, you have the parasympathetic axons traveling to the heart, and you see that they're traveling to the SA node and to the AV node. So that means that the PNS is able to control the heart rate and kind of the way that um, that contractions are or that that action potentials uh, in the myocardium are being distributed from the atria to the ventricles. But you do not have parasympathetic axons going to the rest of the myocardium. So the parasympathetic nervous system does not affect contractility. It will decrease heart rate and therefore decrease cardiac output. Sympathetic nervous system will increase heart rate and contractility, thereby increasing cardiac output. The parasympathetic nervous system actually also does not have any axons that travel to blood vessels. It has no direct way of affecting vasoconstriction or vasodilation at all. Um, only the sympathetic nervous system actually contacts those blood vessels. But the parasympathetic nervous system can indirectly affect um, the vasoconstriction by inhibiting the sympathetic nervous system. So usually when your PNS activates, the SNS will be inhibited, which means that um, the action potentials going along these sympathetic axons to the blood vessels, they're going to get slower, they're going to decrease uh, in, their, in their rate, and the vessels are going to dilate in response. So the PNS inhibits the SNS and that causes vasodilation. Not in all of the blood vessels, again, it's actually going to cause vasodilation in the vessels that serve the digestive, urinary, reproductive, and integumentary systems, and um, most exocrine glands except for sweat glands. The vessels that serve your heart and your skeletal muscle would actually be somewhat constricted by activation of the PNS and inhibition of the SNS. But overall, you're having more uh, vessels dilate when the PNS activates and inhibits the SNS. So overall, you have vasodilation and systemic vascular resistance, or TPR, will go down. Um, and then the decreased heart rate, uh, which decreases cardiac output, and the decreased SVR, uh, or TPR, is going to decrease your blood pressure. So those are the ways that the nervous system is controlling your blood pressure. Um, and it's going to use certain sensors to know what your blood pressure is and kind of how it should be controlling your blood pressure. Um, those sensors are the chemoreceptors and the baroreceptors. So we'll talk about those right now. First, the chemoreceptors. Those are able to sense the partial pressure of oxygen in your blood, also the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood, and the pH. So all chemoreceptors are actually going to be able to respond to all three things, but some of them will sense one more strongly or a different one more strongly. The P there for PO2 and PCO2, the P is for partial pressure. Um, partial pressure is the pressure that one constituent of a gas mixture exerts um, on the walls of a container. So 
If you have a container that's full of air, air is actually a mixture of gases. It's mostly nitrogen, then you have a good amount of oxygen, and then you have a little bit of a bunch of other things like carbon dioxide and argon and a bunch of things. So uh, the nitrogen, all of those gases together are, are contributing to the pressure that the air exerts on the container. The nitrogen is the most common gas in that mixture, so it's exerting the biggest part of the pressure, and that's its partial pressure. The oxygen is the next biggest thing that's also exerting a significant amount of pressure, um, but not as much, So because you have less oxygen in there. So the partial pressure is kind of a way of estimating, well, it's, it's a way of representing like the concentration of a gas in a mixture. So if a gas has a large partial pressure, that would imply that it's a very common gas in that mixture. You have a lot of that gas in the mixture. If you have a low partial pressure, that means you only have a little bit of that gas in the mixture. So nitrogen would have a very high partial pressure, oxygen would be more moderate, and carbon dioxide would have a very low partial pressure uh, if you were just talking about a mixture of air. Um, but you can basically think about PO2 and PCO2 as the concentration of those gases or how much of those gases you have. So the chemoreceptors are sensing how much oxygen you've got, how much carbon dioxide you've got in your blood, and what's the pH of your blood. There's two types of chemoreceptors. You have the peripheral chemoreceptors and the central chemoreceptors. The peripheral ones are found in the carotid body and the aortic body. Those are shown in this drawing here. The aortic body is right here at the top of the aortic arch, and the carotid bodies are here. This would actually be in your neck. Um, that's where the carotid arteries branch in the neck. Those peripheral chemoreceptors uh, can sense all three things, the PO2, the PCO2, and the pH, but they're mainly responding to PO2. So they're mostly sensing how much oxygen you have in your blood but um, they're actually going to respond more strongly to oxygen levels in the blood if you have more uh, carbon dioxide in the blood, more PCO2, or if you have a decreased pH. Um, anytime that you have increased PCO2 or increased CO2 in the blood, you will end up having decreased pH because carbon dioxide is actually an acid. It's a weak acid. So when carbon dioxide goes up, pH will go down. Anytime that's happening, um, the peripheral chemoreceptors will become very sensitive to oxygen. They will respond strongly to small changes in the level of oxygen in your blood. And in general, what they're really responding to is when oxygen is going down, when PO2 is going down. So if you don't have enough oxygen in your blood, they're going to respond to that. Um, and if you also at the same time have too much carbon dioxide in your blood or a too low pH, they're going to respond really strongly. If you have not enough oxygen and at the same time too much PCO2, that probably means that there's something wrong with your breathing. You're not doing gas exchange right to get in the oxygen and get out the carbon dioxide. And they're going to respond to that very strongly. Um, the central chemoreceptors are actually located inside the brain in the medulla oblongata. And they are not really responding very much to PO2, although they can respond to it. Mostly they're responding to PCO2 and pH. So when you have increased uh, carbon dioxide or a decreased pH, which those two things would be going hand in hand, then you're going to get a response from the central chemoreceptors. So the main purpose of those chemoreceptors is so that the brain can kind of get a readout on how you're breathing. Are you oxygenating your blood correctly and getting rid of carbon dioxide correctly? Um, and those chemoreceptors are mostly going to be used to regulate your breathing rate and response. So if you have too little oxygen, your breathing rate would go up. The peripheral chemoreceptors will signal the brain if there's not enough oxygen and your breathing rate will go up. That's their direct effect. Um, and we'll talk about them again when we go over uh, the lungs and the respiratory system. But they also have effects on blood pressure uh, that are indirect. So when you are increasing your breathing rate to fix your PO2 and PCO2 levels and pH levels, um, part of that response is also going to involve increasing the heart rate and causing vasoconstriction. 
and then those things are going to affect your blood pressure. But that's not the main purpose of the chemoreceptor. So that's why we consider those effects to be indirect. Um, next, you have the baroreceptors, which are responding to pressure. Baro means pressure, so they're sensing pressure. That actually means that they're sensing stretch in the walls of your vessels, and that stretch is caused by the pressure of the blood pushing on the vessel walls. You have two uh, kind of sets of baroreceptors. You find them in the carotid sinus and in the aortic sinus. The carotid sinus is this kind of thickened area uh, where the carotid arteries branch right by the carotid bodies. Um, and then the aortic sinus is not shown on this diagram, but it would be right here in the arch of the aorta. Um, so the, the chemoreceptors are actually um, just kind of sticking on, they're kind of stuck on top of the walls of the vessels, but the barrier receptors are actually embedded in the walls of the vessels, in the, in the aortic sinus and the carotid sinuses. Whenever your blood pressure goes up, um, that's going to cause more stretch in the aortic and carotid, uh, carotid sinuses, and um, that's going to be picked up by the barrier receptors. They're going to start responding to that. Um, on the other hand, if your blood pressure goes down, you're going to have less stretch in those vessels, and the barrier receptors will uh, sense that as well. Um, they're going to respond to those blood pressure changes uh, in a reflex that we call the barrier receptor reflex, which we're going to talk about on the next slide. Okay, so here's the baroreceptor reflex. Um, if your blood pressure goes up, if it goes up above normal, you're going to have greater stretch in the carotid and aortic sinuses. That's going to cause the baroreceptors to start firing. Um, those signals are going to travel into the, into the brain, into the medulla oblongata, and the brain will coordinate a response. The response is going to be to activate the parasympathetic nervous system, decreasing the heart rate, inhibiting the sympathetic nervous system, and therefore causing vasodilation. It's important to remember the parasympathetic nervous system does not directly affect vasodilation. It can only affect it by inhibiting the sympathetic nervous system. When you have a lower heart rate and more vasodilation, that's going to cause your blood pressure to go back down to the normal range. So that's one side of the baroreceptor reflex. It can also go the other way. If your blood pressure drops below normal, you're going to have less stretch in the carotid and aortic sinuses. Um, the baroreceptors will respond to that as well. They're going to fire less frequently than normal. Those signals will go into the medulla oblongata, and the medulla oblongata will coordinate a response, which is going to be to activate the sympathetic nervous system. So when the sympathetic nervous system activates, you're going to have increase in contractility and heart rate and vasoconstriction. Those things are going to increase um, your blood pressure by increasing cardiac output and vascular resistance. The baroreceptor reflex is constantly kind of active in your body to maintain blood pressure at a normal level um, in the face of kind of small changes moment to moment in your life. So for instance, if you are sitting down and then you stand up, that's going to cause a drop in your blood pressure. The baroreceptor reflex will activate, your heart rate will go up, you'll have vasoconstriction, um, and that is going to uh, gonna, gonna restore your blood pressure to a normal level. Um, anything like that, where you have just a change in your blood pressure, the baroreceptor uh, reflex is gonna activate and restore it to normal. Um, the Valsalva maneuver is something that we do to test the baroreceptor reflex. Uh, in that maneuver, you're going to close your airway by you know, closing your mouth and plugging your nose and then you try, you compress your abdominal muscles and you're trying to push air out, but it has nowhere to go. Um, so when that happens, you're gonna increase the pressure in your thoracic cavity and you can actually trigger the baroreceptor reflex and you should be able to see uh, the response of your heart and your blood pressure uh, when, when that's triggered. So if you don't have a strong baroreceptor reflex, that's generally not a, not a good sign. Um, there's also a syndrome called vasovagal syncope. Vaso there meaning blood vessels, vagal meaning the vagus nerve, which is the major nerve that carries parasympathetic uh, axons to the body, which you might remember from AMP1, and then syncope because of fading. 
So vasovagal syncope is when you faint in response to just some emotional upsetness. Um, so this would be like in old times when they would talk about ladies getting the vapors, uh, you know, and fainting <laughs> because of some some thing that's happened that's shocking to them. That's vasovagal syncope, actually. We don't really understand vasovagal syncope, but it's clear that it involves an extreme activation of the parasympathetic nervous system and no bare receptor reflex in response. So when you have this extreme parasympathetic nervous system activation, that's going to decrease your blood pressure. Um, normally, the bare receptor reflex should sense the decreased blood pressure and kick in to raise it back to a normal level. In the vasovagal syncope syndrome, that doesn't happen. Your blood pressure remains low and your, your brain is going to not get enough oxygen and you're going to pass out. Um, why there is no bare receptor reflex, that, that one we don't know though. So the endocrine system also controls blood pressure. It can control it in the short term and in the long term. The short term um, endocrine control of the, of the blood pressure is always focused on cardiac output and vascular resistance. Um, the endocrine system also controls blood volume, but any change that's made to blood volume is going to have a long term impact on blood pressure, not a short term. So here we're talking about changes that occur over minutes to hours. Um, and the endocrine system within minutes to hours can have effects on the cardiac output and on the vascular resistance that will impact blood pressure. The four uh, or five hormones that are involved here are epinephrine, angiotensin II, AMP and BNP, and thyroid hormone. Epinephrine is going to be released anytime the sympathetic nervous system is activated, and it basically does the same thing as the sympathetic nervous system. So it's going to increase heart rate, increase contractility, those things increase cardiac output, that increases blood pressure. At the same time, it's going to cause vasoconstriction in your uh, vessels serving digestive, urinary, reproductive, integumentary systems, and most extracranial glands, um, and that is going to increase vascular resistance, therefore increasing blood pressure. Epinephrine is going to both enhance the sympathetic nervous system effects and prolong them so that they last longer. When the sympathetic nervous system stops firing, um, it's, gonna, its effects are going to end. Unless epinephrine has been released, epinephrine will continue having those effects until it's actually removed from the bloodstream. Uh, then we have angiotensin II, which causes vasoconstriction. So angiotensin II is going to be released uh, when the kidneys sense that you have less blood pressure or if the kidneys sense that there's less oxygen in your blood, then they're going to, um, well, they're actually directly going to release renin. Um, and that's going to kick off a series of events that leads to the activation and release of angiotensin II, which then causes vasoconstriction, and then that increases vascular resistance, and that increases blood pressure. AMP and BNP are both hormones that are released from the heart. Uh, that's atrial natriuretic peptide and brain natri natriuretic peptide. Uh, the BMP is actually misnamed. It's not released from the brain. It's released from the heart, from the ventricles. So it should probably be called VNP, but it's not. So AMP and BMP are released from the heart when the heart senses that there's too much stretch in the heart um, because of too much blood filling the heart. Um, the effects of those hormones is going to be the same. They cause vasodilation, and then vasodilation uh, decreases vascular resistance decreased vascular resistance will decrease blood pressure and that's going to kind of ease up the strain on the heart it'll mean that less blood is coming back into the heart finally you have thyroid hormone um, the main effects of thyroid hormone are to regulate your metabolism but thyroid hormone will also increase beta receptors um, beta receptor expression in your contractile cardiomyocytes so uh, beta receptors are um, an adrenergic receptor that binds epinephrine and norepinephrine. It's one of the receptors that's used by the sympathetic nervous system for signaling to target organs, which you may remember from ANP1. So the sympathetic nervous system will release norepinephrine as a neurotransmitter. It also causes the release of epinephrine as a hormone. Both of those things can bind to alpha and beta adrenergic receptors, which are found in different parts of the body. In the heart, you have beta receptors. They would actually be found not just in contractile cardiomyocytes, but in the uh, pacemaker cardiomyocytes as well. So in all of the cardiomyocytes, you'll have the beta receptors. 
when you have more beta receptors in those cells, um, you're going to have more places for epinephrine or norepinephrine to bind, and it's going to enhance the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. If you were to decrease the amount of beta receptors, that would do the opposite thing. It would actually reduce the effects of sympathetic nervous system activation on the heart, but thyroid hormone increases them. Uh, the endocrine system can also affect blood volume, which changes blood pressure in the long term, so over the course of days or weeks. Um, you've got another five hormones that affect blood volume. They are ADH, angiotensin 2, aldosterone, and AMP and BMP. So angiotensin 2 and AMP and BMP we already talked about because they affect um, vascular resistance, which then ends up affecting blood pressure. So the effects of those hormones on vascular resistance are part of short-term endocrine control because they affect vascular resistance and that has a quick effect on blood pressure. Uh, the effect of angiotensin II and AMP and BMP on blood volume are considered part of long-term endocrine control because blood volume has long-term effects on blood pressure. Uh, but backing up to ADH, ADH is antidiuretic hormone. It causes your kidneys to retain water and it makes you thirsty. So that means that you're going to drink more water. At the same time, you're producing less urine. Overall, your blood volume will go up and blood pressure will go up. Um, then you have the RAAS, which is the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Um, so two of the hormones in there that are active are angiotensin II and aldosterone. Angiotensin II, in addition to causing vasoconstriction for short-term control, causes you to become thirsty and it's responsible for the secretion of aldosterone. Um, and I've got a diagram on the next slide actually that shows the RAAS in a bit more detail. So angiotensin II increases thirst. That means you're going to drink more, your blood volume will go up, um, and therefore blood pressure will go up. Angiotensin II also causes aldosterone to be secreted, and then aldosterone affects the kidneys, causing them to retain water. That means you're going to make less urine, um, and as you keep drinking at a normal rate or an increased rate because of angiotensin II, uh, you're going to end up with a greater blood volume, which then increases blood pressure. AMP and BNP will do the opposite thing to the kidneys. They cause uh, excretion of water to increase. So you're going to produce more urine and your blood volume will go down and that decreases blood pressure. Again, easing strain on the heart. Okay, so here's the RAAS, also AMP and BNP, and they're kind of opposite effects on blood pressure. Um, so on the bottom here, you have the RAAS. That's all going to start with the kidneys. The RAAS is going to be activated anytime the kidneys sense low oxygen or low blood pressure. Um, when they sense those things, they're going to release renin, which enters the blood and it activates this horm hormone angiotensinogen that comes from the liver. So the liver is actually always producing angiotensinogen, but angiotensinogen is not active. So it doesn't do anything. It just kind of sets there in the blood and waits. When the kidneys sense low pressure or low oxygen, then they release the renin. That's going to activate angiotensinogen 2, or sorry, it's going to activate angiotensinogen and ultimately kick off the RAAS. So renin is actually going to activate angiotensinogen 2, angiotensin 1, which is also not active. Um, it still needs to go through one more step to be fully active. It's going to be moving in the blood. It's going to pass through the lungs. In the lungs, you have an enzyme that's stuck onto the endothelium. Um, that enzyme is angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE. So you may have heard of, you may have heard of ACE inhibitors. Those are uh, drugs that inhibit this enzyme, angiotensin converting enzyme. If you inhibit this enzyme, you cannot turn on the RAAS, and that is overall going to help you lower blood pressure. Um, so angiotensin 1 is going to be converted to angiotensin 2 by angiotensin converting enzyme in the lungs. Angiotensin 2 is actually an active hormone at last. Angiotensin 2 is going to cause vasoconstriction. It's also going to increase thirst and it's going to um, cause the adrenal glands to release aldosterone. Aldosterone goes to the kidneys and causes it to uh, retain water then that water retention causes blood volume to go up. 
then your blood volume increase and your vasoconstriction from angiotensin II are both going to increase blood pressure. Um, and then that's basically the RAS. If your blood pressure goes up above normal, then you're going to get too much blood in the heart, overloading it, um, causing too much stretch in the chambers of the heart. The heart is then going to uh, release atrial natriuretic peptide, AMP. It'll also release BMP. Those two hormones do basically the same thing. They're going to cause vasodilation, um, lowering resistance, and they're also going to affect the kidneys, causing, causing water excretion and thereby lowering blood volume. Both of those effects, the lowered blood volume and the vasodilation, are going to cause lower blood pressure, and your blood pressure goes back to normal, hopefully. Okay, you also have another type of blood pressure control that's kind of um, just automatic, uh, and it happens in the kidneys. This involves blood volume, so this is a long, this is a type of long-term blood pressure control. And it's basically just because um, blood pressure determines the rate at which the kidneys form urine. So uh, we'll go over this in a lot more detail when we cover the urinary system, but in the kidneys, you have these little uh, capsules where you have a capillary bed coming in. Um, well, technically, actually, you would have an arterial coming in, forming a capillary bed inside this capsule, and then another arterial leaving. It's a special capillary bed, so it has an arterial coming out the other side, not a venule. Um, and the blood pressure is going to be forcing blood through these capillaries, um, and blood will actually, well, not all blood, but the plasma in the blood, not the cells, will be forced out of the walls of these capillaries and into this capsule. And then it's going to enter tubules and be formed into urine. So the fluid that leaves the blood and enters this capsule is like proto-urine, basically. Um, when you have more blood pressure in the blood, you're going to be having more blood rush through these capillaries and you're going to have a bigger pressure gradient between the blood pressure of the capillaries and the pressure of the fluid of the proto-urine in this capsule. Uh, when you have more blood pressure here and less blood pressure here, you're going to have more fluid leaving the blood and entering the capsule. That means you're going to make more urine. So more blood pressure means more urine made. When you make more urine, you have less blood volume, and that means that blood pressure goes down. The opposite thing will also happen. If you have less blood pressure here, then you're going to force less fluid out through these capillary walls. You're going to form less urine, and less urine means more blood volume and more blood pressure. So that just kind of happens automatically, and the body doesn't have to do anything um, to make that occur. Uh, well, at least I should say the body doesn't have to do anything extra to make that occur, other than just having kidneys that work. So finally, we'll talk about hypertension, which is high blood pressure, of course. Hypertension is similar to CAD, a silent killer. Uh, and we call it that again because generally there's no symptoms of it until something goes seriously wrong and you have a crisis. Um, so typically, since blood pressure is real easy to test, uh, you would start getting tests of your blood pressure done regularly as you age or as you have risk factors. Uh, CAD is not so easy to test for <laughs> as hypertension, unfortunately. Um, hypertension can actually cause CAD. It can also cause stroke, and it can cause damage basically to any organ uh, in your body uh, because it damages the walls of the blood vessels, and every organ in your body relies on those vessels for its supply of nutrients and oxygen. So... Uh, any place you have a lot of capillaries, that's a place where you can have a lot of damage from hypertension, and technically any organ is vulnerable to damage from hypertension because all the blood vessels, well, all the capillaries are vulnerable, and all the little blood vessels are vulnerable. Um, so if you measure your blood pressure and it's high, that doesn't mean that you have hypertension. You can't diagnose it with just one measurement. You have to have multiple measurements across a period of time that are all high, um, without an explanation of why they were high, like you were just exercising, um, in order to diagnose hypertension. And you can do it according to this chart. Normal blood pressure should be under 120 systolic, under 80 diastolic. It's mostly the systolic pressure that um, is getting real high in hypertension. 
Uh, so if you're 120 to 129, that's not hypertension yet. That's elevated blood pressure. Your diastolic would still be uh, hopefully under 80 in that range. Um, if you actually have hypertension, then you would have a systolic blood pressure of 130 to 139 for stage 1 or 80 to 89 for diastolic. If you have uh, stage 2 hypertension, then you would have 140 or above, well, 140 to 179 in your systolic blood pressure and 90 um, to 119 in your diastolic. And if you get up to uh, 180 or above in your systolic or 120 or above on your diastolic, that's considered a hypertensive crisis. So that's no longer a chronic disease that's gonna slowly damage your body. That is going to hurt you right away and you need, uh, you need to go, you, well, you need to go to the doctor right away. Um, because what can happen if the pressure gets way too high like that is that one of your uh, vessels could actually burst and you could die very quickly if that happens. Um, there's two basic types of hypertension beyond the stage one and stage two, which refer to the severity. You can either have essential hypertension, uh, which is also called primary hypertension, or you could have secondary hypertension. Usually people have essential hypertension or primary hypertension. What that means is that we don't know why you have it, basically. Um, primary meaning that it's not caused by something else. Essential meaning that, well, <laughs> it's just what it is and we don't know why it's happening. So we usually don't know why people have hypertension. Um, but sometimes your hypertension is actually caused by a different condition that you have, and that would be considered secondary hypertension. It's better to have secondary hypertension in general because if you can treat that first condition that's causing it, that means the hypertension is going to go away in general. Um, for primary hypertension, there are medications that can treat that, but usually uh, we would like to treat it with lifestyle changes first if we can. Um, because medications have side effects and, you know, it's just kind of hard to be taking a drug every day for your whole life um, and, and with the side effects. Uh, so, you know, it's better to, to address the issue in another way if that's possible. So some of those lifestyle changes might be, you know, avoiding stress, um, exercising. Uh, of course, your blood pressure will go up while you're exercising, but if you do a lot of cardio and you get kind of fit, you should have a lower blood pressure at rest because of that and a lower heart rate too. Um, also diet changes like limiting sodium, um, that's gonna lower your blood pressure. So that's hypertension, having too much blood pressure. On the other hand, you could have too little blood pressure. In general, if your blood pressure is, above, is below normal, that's not like a bad thing uh, unless it's real below normal. And at that point, you're in big trouble and you may have shock. Um, shock basically is when you have too little blood pressure to sustain blood flow in the arteries. So blood will stop moving through the arteries. Uh, that means that you don't have your organs getting enough oxygen. And if you can't fix that, you will die. There's three stages to shock. You have compensated, progressive, and irreversible shock, or stages one, two, and three. In compensated shock, you have your homeostatic mechanisms kicking in, and they're successfully raising your blood pressure back up to normal. So you might have like a normal blood pressure or, you know, kind of low but not crazy low, but you're going to have like your sympathetic nervous system highly activated, increasing your heart rate and increasing vasoconstriction in order to maintain that normal blood pressure. So it's not just like you're normal, you're doing everything you can to get back to normal. In progressive shock, um, it's no longer possible for your body to return you to normal using the regular homeostatic mechanisms. At that point, your, your blood flow is going to decrease and your organs will start taking damage from not getting enough oxygen. Um, we say that they're hypoxic because they don't have enough oxygen. That's hypo for low and oxic for oxygen. And then instead of saying two O's in a row, we say hypoxic. Um, so they're still working, but you know, they are taking damage and it's not good. Um, at this stage, it is still possible to save you with medical intervention, but your body is not able to fix it by itself anymore. So without medical uh, intervention, you will most likely die if you have progressive shock. 
if there is no medical intervention, um, you know, you're not able to uh, get to a hospital or something, then you may progress to irreversible shock. At ir when you're in irreversible shock, it basically it means that it's impossible to save you. The organs have had too little oxygen for too long. They have too much damage. There's no way to restore their functionality. There's just too many dead cells. You will die. Um, so there's a lot of types of shock that they all go through those same three stages and they all kind of end in the same place. So the different types of shock will have a different cause, but they all end up the same. And they all involve too little blood flow going to your organs. Um, some of the major types of shock are hypovolemic shock. Um, in hypovolemic shock, you don't have enough blood volume, and that means that you don't have enough blood pressure, and you enter shock. You could also have cardiogenic shock, which is shock that originates because of a problem with the heart. That would mean that cardiac output is too low to sustain your blood pressure, uh, to sustain blood flow. So maybe your heart rate is too low, or it could be a stroke volume problem as well. Just something wrong with the heart so that your cardiac output is too low and you enter shock. In distributive shock, you actually have massive widespread vasodilation in all your vessels. So that would be like if you don't have that sympathetic tone anymore, that could be distributive shock. Um, if all your vessels dilate, that means that your blood is going to end up um, not flowing well. It's actually going to end up um, in the veins a lot. Right, the, the blood reservoir in the veins is going to kind of expand and you're going to end up with like all your blood there trapped in your veins and not coming out again. Uh, and that is going to cause blood flow to crash. Uh, and you'll enter shock. Then you have neurogenic shock, which can be similar to distributive shock because it involves um, damage to the brain that basically prevents the sympathetic nervous system from causing vasoconstriction. Um, right, so you should always have at rest some vasoconstriction, like a medium amount of vasoconstriction in your vessels to maintain regular blood pressure and regular blood flow. If that stops, if your sympathetic nervous system is knocked out, or if you have damage to the nerves that are con connecting your SNS with your body, then you're going to have your vessels dilate, you're going to enter neurogenic shock. Then you have anaphylactic shock, which is basically a response to an allergic reaction. Well, I should say it's an extreme allergic reaction. Um, in an allergic reaction, you have just a really strong response of your immune system to some stimulus that isn't really a problem. Um, and if you have um, if you have this response happening kind of over your whole body or too much of your body, then you could enter the anaphylactic shock. That's because part of the immune system response is inflammation, and part of inflammation is increased vascular permeability, meaning that it's easier for fluids to uh, cross the walls of your blood vessels. If that happens in, across too much of your body, um, your blood is basically not going to stay in your blood vessels. It's going to leave. It's going to go into the tissues. That means your blood volume is going to drop, and you're going to enter shock. Then finally, we have septic shock, which is similar to anaphylactic shock as well, but um, it's, it's more related to an infection. So in septic shock, you will also have an extreme immune system response with widespread inflammation across your body, um, and you're, you're going to have low blood volume and therefore shock. Uh, but in the septic shock, what differentiates it from anaphylactic shock is that um, it's not an allergic reaction that's causing it, it's an infection, and especially an infection in your blood. So a blood infection is going to potentially cause septic shock. And this diagram here is just showing some of the events that occur, some of the chain of events that occur in stage 3 shock. Um, so no matter what type of shock uh, it was, you're going to end up in this kind of, um, this kind of chain of events. So you are going to have not enough blood flow in your arteries. Therefore, you're going to end up not enough blood coming back to the heart. And that's going to mean um, that your preload is down. That's going to mean your cardiac, uh, your stroke volume is down. That's going to mean your cardiac output is down. And so decreased cardiac output. Then because you have less cardiac output, you're going to have less blood pressure. Because you have less blood pressure, you're going to have less blood flow um, in the systemic circuit. 
because you have less blood flow, your tissues, including the heart, are not getting enough oxygen or enough glucose and other nutrients. Also, when you don't have as much blood flow, the blood is slowing down. It's going to kind of chill out, <laughs> and it's not supposed to chill out in one spot. When that happens, it's possible for you to have clotting occur, um, and that's going to be its own problem. Uh, when you have a lot of clots forming, that makes it hard for blood to flow, of course, um, through the vessels, and that means that less blood comes back to the heart, and then that also decreases cardiac output, and we go around in a circle like this basically until your organs have taken too much damage and you die. Um, you know, because your tissues are getting not enough, um, not enough oxygen and nutrients, they're also going to stop working as well. Your brain will be not getting enough oxygen. The vessels themselves can end up not getting enough oxygen if you don't have proper circulation. These things are all going to be taking damage. When your tissues are taking damage, um, you're going to have them releasing toxins as cells die. Some of the uh, components they release from inside of them are going to be toxic to the other cells that are still alive. Um, that can cause, some of those uh, toxins can cause vasodilation, which even more decreases your blood pressure. Um, also, uh, when, you're, when your vessels are taking damage from not enough oxygen, their walls are going to increase their permeability. Um, and when the brain is taking damage from not enough oxygen, you're going to have less vasomotor activity, which means less activity of the SNS sustaining vasoconstriction, which also feeds back into vasodilation. Then now that you have this extra vasodilation, your blood flow will go down again. Now you're going to have blood, you know, chilling out even more in the vessels, especially in the veins, since they're the blood reservoir. That's going to give you even more clotting. Uh, and when the blood's not moving again, that decreases your venous return, decreasing cardiac output. When you have increased capillary permeability from this damage to your blood vessels because they didn't have enough oxygen, that's going to mean that fluid starts leaving the blood vessels, your blood volume goes down, that also decreases venous return, which decreases cardiac output, and finally, some of these toxins that are released from damaged tissues um, will actually damage the heart as well, causing it to reduce the heart rate, and that reduces cardiac output as well. And you're going to go around this little circle, well, this little maze that just goes in a circle and, until someone saves you or you're dead. How fun. <laughs> okay, now we'll talk about capillary exchange, which means how uh, substances are moving across the capillary walls. That would include gases, of course, uh, but that also includes waste products. Well, CO2 is a waste product, but it includes other waste products and other nutrients like glucose um, and just also water itself. So earlier we talked about the structure of arteries and veins, but we didn't specifically talk about the structure of capillaries. While your arteries and veins have the three layers, the tunica intima, tunica media, and tunica externa or adventitia, the capillaries only have the tunica intima, but we actually don't even call it the tunica intima because it's not even a complete tunica intima. The regular tunica intima for arteries and veins would have the endothelium, the subendothelium, and the internal, the internal elastic lamina. The capillaries don't have um, the, the subendothelium or the internal elastic lamina. They only have endothelium. So really, the capillary wall is just the endothelium and the basement membrane that goes with that endothelium. That's it. So that's one single layer of cells and a membrane at the bottom of them. That's all there is to the wall. The wall needs to be that simple and because it's very thin that way. When it's very thin, that makes it easy for gases to cross, and it needs to be very easy for gas to get in and out of the capillaries to serve the tissues. Um, so here you have your typical capillary wall with your endothelium and the basement membrane of that endothelium. You're also going to have tight junctions connecting the endothelial cells to each other um, and preventing substances from just moving freely between the cells. Uh, that way substances will move across the cells and the cells are able to control how those substances are moving for a lot of different things, not for everything. Um, you also have these special cells in the capillaries called parasites. They are actually embedded in the basement membrane of the endothelium. 
They have a variety of functions that just basically help the endothelium uh, maintain its homeostasis. One of the important functions they have is to help constrict the capillaries um, when certain conditions um, are met, but we won't really worry about that. Um, capillaries are very small. The lumen of the capillary is generally big enough for one red blood cell, so they have to go through a single file. There's some exceptions to that because there's different types of capillaries and some of them are bigger, um, but for most capillaries, the blood cells go through single file. In general, um, when a blood cell is entering a capillary, it should go through it in one second and be coming out the other side into a venule within one second. You have three types of capillaries, continuous, fenestrated, and sinusoidal. Most capillaries are continuous capillaries. Um, in continuous capillaries, the endothelial cells are pretty tightly connected to each other using tight junctions, but you do have a few really tiny gaps between them where things can cross. Um, then you have, in certain locations, uh, fenestrated capillaries. The fen uh, well, fenestrated means windowed. The word fenestra uh, just means a window. So fenestrated capillaries have these little windows, which are basically little holes in the endothelial cells. They also have bigger gaps between the endothelial cells with fewer tight junctions. So that means that it's easier for things to cross uh, out, in and out of a fenestrated capillary, but it also means that as a trade-off, the capillary walls can uh, not have as much control over how things are crossing. So less stuff crossing means better control, uh, more stuff crossing means not as good control. The primary places where you would find fenestrated capillaries are in the intestines and the kidneys. In the intestines, you need to absorb food from the gut, so you need a lot of ability for things to enter the capillaries easily. In the kidneys, you're trying to form urine, so you want it to be pretty easy for things to leave the capillaries and enter the urine. Then finally, you have sinusoidal capillaries. Those are also called sinusoids, um, which is because it's just shorter. The sinusoids have really big holes in the endothelial cells. They also have really big gaps between the endothelial cells. Sometimes those cells don't even touch each other. Um, and they also can have an incomplete basement membrane. And they also have a larger diameter than other capillaries. So they can fit more cells in them at a time, and the holes in them are actually big enough for cells to squeeze through. So in this diagram here, you can see the incomplete basement membrane, the big holes in the endothelial cells, and the big gaps between them. Those gaps are big enough for cells to get through, actually. Um, then you have the fenestrated capillaries with the little windows, and the continuous capillaries with no windows and the tight junctions. Um, the places where you would find the sinusoids are going to be the liver, the spleen, and the bone marrow. In the liver, um, you have a need for filtration of the blood. It's uh, the, well, specifically the blood that's come from the hepatic portal vein. Needs, that all needs to be filtered. Uh, so not only are you removing substances from the blood, but if there happen to be any bacteria in there, you would want to remove that as well. Um, in the spleen, you're filtering the blood as well and exposing it to all of the immune cells. Um, and then in the bone marrow, that's where you're actually, of course, as you remember, making the blood in the first place, or I should say, making the uh, formed elements of the blood. So those are all places where cells of the body would have a need to cross easily in and out of the capillaries. Therefore, you have sinusoids there. So there's a couple of ways that stuff can cross the wall of a capillary. It can cross by diffusion or by osmosis. If it's water, it's going to cross by osmosis. If it's not water, it'll be crossing by diffusion. Um, that includes things going between the cells, through the gaps, or through the holes. That could also include things going through the cells, crossing one side of the membrane, coming out the other side of the membrane. Um, things that would travel between the cells or through little gaps uh, or holes in the cells would frequently include, um, well, any small molecule and especially ones that are charged or polar, um, just because it's harder for those things to get across a cell membrane. 
then things that like to cross through a cell would be um, gases and lipids. Gases and lipids are going to be able to diffuse freely through a cell membrane. Um, the gases because they're in so incredibly small and the lipids because they're nonpolar. Um, although you can also have charged or polar molecules diffusing through a cell if you have appropriate transporters or channels to give them a path to cross the membrane. Then for big things, you would use transitosis to get it uh, across the cell. Um, in transitosis, you have uh, endocytosis occurring on one side of the cell and exocytosis on the other side. That would generally mean that on the lumen facing side, you have the endocytosis where something is taken into the cell and wrapped up in a vesicle. And on the opposite side, the tissue side of the cell, you would have exocytosis where that vesicle fuses with the cell uh, membrane and drops off its comp its uh, its the stuff inside of it. <laughs> so here you have a diagram of that. Um, here you have some small um, maybe gases or some lipids diffusing through uh, the cell. Here you have charged things going through a hole in the cell by diffusion. Um, some more charged things traveling or polar things traveling through the gap between the cells by diffusion. Water would also be crossing mostly through these holes or between the cells by diffusion since water is a polar molecule. And then here you have your transcytosis for the large molecules where they're being taken up by endocytosis on one side wrapped in a vesicle. Then on the other side they do exocytosis and the vesicle fuses with the membrane and the stuff is released. So now we'll talk about the structure of a capillary bed. Um, every capillary bed has, well, most capillary beds have a characteristic structure where you have a central vessel going through the middle of it, connecting the um, arterial side to the venial side. And then you also have true capillaries branching off of that central vessel. So here you have um, a capillary bed. Here's your arterial side, here's the venial side, and in the middle is the central vessel. Coming off of the central vessel are the true capillaries. The central vessel is divided into uh, three parts. Um, on the arterial side, the central vessel is actually a metarterial. So that's an arterial, not even a capillary really. Um, and these little um, bands of smooth muscle that you find uh, every time a true capillary branches off the metarterial, those are your precapillary sphincters that control blood flow through the capillary bed. Um, then in the middle of that central vessel, you have what's called the thoroughfare channel. Um, and then on the other side, uh, on the venule side of the uh, central vessel, you have a postcapillary venule. So this part is actually a postcapillary venule that drains into a venule. So arterial, metarterial, thoroughfare channel, postcapillary venule, then venule. Then the true capillaries are branching off from that central vessel. Um, where they're branching off of the metarterial part, you have the precapillary sphincters that can control blood flow through the capillary bed. Um, and the capillaries are connected to each other with many anastomoses, many extra paths between these capillaries. Um, so the body can regulate flow through the capillary bed by contracting these precapillary sphincters. So if you contract all these sphincters, what's going to happen is that blood doesn't enter the capillary bed. It just goes straight through the thoroughfare channel and comes out the other side. At any given time, some of your capillaries will be open with the relaxed precapillary sphincters and others are going to be closed with contracted precapillary sphincters. If you had literally all of your capillary beds open at the same time, that would be bad. Um, probably you would have uh, your blood pressure reduced as a result of that. Um, we have two terms that pertain to blood traveling through a capillary bed. First, you have the microcirculation, which is actual blood flow through the capillary bed. Blood is going to be caused to flow through that bed by a blood pressure gradient. So um, as you may recall, you have you know, not a lot of blood pressure in those capillary beds, but you do have more on the 
arterial side than you have on the venule side. And since the capillary bed is pretty short, that's actually enough of a gradient between the arterial side and the venule side to drive blood flow through the capillary bed. Then when it comes out on the venule side, you have really very little blood pressure left whatsoever. And you would have other mechanisms causing the blood to flow through the veins and be returned to the heart. Um, there's also the term tissue perfusion, which refers to how much blood is supplied to a tissue by the capillary bed. So microcirculation and tissue perfusion are really closely related terms. It's like they almost mean the same thing because if you have a microcirculation, then you're gonna have tissue perfusion. If you don't have a microcirculation, you're not gonna have tissue perfusion for that tissue. But they're technically a little bit different. Microcirculation is the actual flow of blood through the capillary bed and tissue perfusion is how that tissue is being supplied with blood because of the microcirculation through the capillary bed. And the body is able to control the perfusion of tissues caused by microcirculation in the capillary beds. Um, first, arterial blood pressure uh, controls perfusion. The more arterial blood pressure you have in general, the bigger the gradient is for blood pressure across the capillary bed, which means you're gonna have a bigger microcircul microcirculation or more flow of blood through the capillary bed. Right? So if you have higher blood pressure on the arterial end, but still the same blood pressure on the venule end, that's a bigger gradient. You're gonna have more flow, more microcirculation, more perfusion. You also have the precapillary sphincters, of course, controlling uh, perfusion. If your uh, precapillary sphincters are constricted, then you're not going to have microcirculation in that capillary bed, and you're not going to have perfusion of those tissues. Then finally, you have autoregulation, which means how the local tissues are regulating themselves, basically, or regulating their own perfusion. There's two types of autoregulation for capillaries. You have the myogenic mechanism and metabolic controls. The myogenic mechanism, uh, the purpose of it is to maintain a steady flow of blood or a steady microcirculation through the capillary bed. In general, one second per red blood cell is what's ideal. The metabolic controls are a little bit different. They're designed to match the microcirculation to the needs of the tissue at that time, depending on how much oxygen the tissue is consuming. And we'll go through both of those right now. So first, the myogenic mechanism, which is based on stretch of the arterioles. Um, when your arterioles are stretched because you have greater blood pressure in them, um, there's stress receptors in them that are going to be activated. And when those receptors are activated, uh, muscle contraction is triggered. Um, so notice this is happening in arterioles, not in the capillaries themselves, even though what's being regulated is blood flow through the capillaries and therefore perfusion of the tissue those capillaries are serving. So um, when you have um, greater blood pressure, that means your blood is pushing on the walls of those arterioles with greater force. It's gonna stretch the walls. And then you have these stretch receptors, which are basically just ion channels in the membrane that are sensitive to stretch. When you have stretch, they open and ions will flow through and those ions will cause an action potential in the smooth muscle cells in the arterial cell wall, um, in the arterial uh, vessel wall that is, and that causes a contraction. Uh, the reason why you need that to happen is because if your blood pressure went up and you didn't do anything about it in the arterioles, that means that blood velocity is going to go up through the arterioles and through the capillaries which means that um, as every red blood cell is going through faster, it spends less time, of course, in the capillary. And that means you don't have your full one second that you need for proper gas exchange. So if the red blood cells go through the capillary bed too fast, they will not drop off all their oxygen or pick up all the carbon dioxide that they needed to pick up. So you need to slow them down so that you can have proper gas exchange. When you um, sense that increased blood pressure and constrict the arterial in response, uh, that means that since you have more vasoconstriction, you have more resistance. And in this case, you have so much resistance that is actually going to reduce the velocity of blood moving through the arterial and therefore moving through the capillary. So um, in this case, the resistance is having a great effect 
on the blood velocity, uh, that's it's, it's having an effect that's actually greater than the effect of cross-sectional area on the velocity. Um, and the opposite thing will occur also if you have less blood pressure, um, then you're going to have less stretch on the uh, arterioles and they're going to pick that up and their, uh, their smooth muscle in the walls will relax. They're, they're going to dilate in response and that means that um, velocity will go up to uh, always stay at about one second per red blood cell in the capillary. So this graph is showing the onset of that myogenic mechanism. This is um, the pressure in an arterial. This is the diameter of an arterial. So if you have something happens that cause something that happens that causes the blood pressure to increase in this arterial, um, it'll go up. And then in response, the size of the vessel walls will go up as the vessel is stretched due to that increased blood pressure then your myogenic mechanism is going to kick in and the walls of the vessel will contract um, and the diameter will go down, which means you're actually going to level off the blood pressure. Or sorry, you're going you're gonna to level off, um, you're going to increase the resistance and level off the velocity of the blood. Next we have the metabolic controls, which can also be called acidic metabolic vasodilation or hypoxic vasodilation. So depending on what source you're looking at, you could see it called any one of those three things. Um, my favorite term is actually hypoxic vasodilation because that kind of tells you the most about what's happening. You have hypoxia, uh, less oxygen in the blood, and then that causes vasodilation. That's basically what's happening. But the book uses the term metabolic control. Um, so on the test, I'm gonna use both terms um, so you can remember whichever one you prefer. Um, this is all based on the idea that when a tissue's activity level increases, it uses more oxygen uh, to make ATP in respiration. Not only does it use more oxygen, it's also using more glucose and turning that glucose into CO2, so its CO2 production goes up as well. Then anytime you have more CO2 production, you have more uh, protons produced also, and the pH will go down. Uh, so this diagram is showing you basically how um, how that works, how CO2 ends up producing protons. Um, and this only happens when the CO2 is in water. So your carbon dioxide in water is going to react with that water to form carbonic acid or H2CO3. Then anytime you have carbonic acid in water, it's going to lose a proton and you end up with bicarbonate, which is HCO3 minus. So because of this, anytime you have more CO2, you end up with more free protons. CO2 goes to carbonic acid, that goes to bicarbonate and free protons. The capillary is able to sense um, all these things. It's able to sense the increased CO2, the increased protons, the decreased pH, and the decreased oxygen. Um, those things will always happen whenever a tissue is more active and it's going to be picked up by those capillaries. Um, then those capillaries are going to release molecules that cause vasodilation. There's multiple ones that they can release. One of the main ones they release, or one of the most famous ones they release, is nitric oxide, which is NO. So you have nitric oxide released from the endothelium of the capillaries. Then that's going to travel to the arterioles, and that's going to cause vasodilation there. Nitric oxide is a very powerful vasodilator. Um, and then uh, once you have that vasodilation in the arterioles, you're going to have increased microcirculation or increased flow of blood through the capillary bed. Then since you have increased blood flow, you end up with increased oxygen supply, increased perfusion of the tissue. Um, so the oxygen levels increase to match the tissue's activity level. This will happen in reverse as well. If you have a tissue that is less active, it's going to be using less oxygen, making less CO2, um, and it'll be making less free protons, so have a higher pH. The capillaries are going to pick up on that also, and they're going to stop releasing um, those vasodilators they release like nitric oxide. In response, your uh, arteries, or the arterioles that is, are going to constrict, and you'll have reduced flow of blood to that area, or to that capillary bed. Um, in this way, you can always match the, um, the needs of a tissue to its supply of oxygen um, and glucose.
So we also have a few um, organs of the body that have a special perfusion uh, that's not kind of normal. One of them is the heart. In the heart, you have a very high perfusion level, um, very high levels of microcirculation. The heart, uh, you know, <laughs> it's really important. It really matters that it always have has the oxygen that it needs and it never runs out and it also never gets to rest and never gets to stop working. So it has these constant needs for oxygen that can sometimes increase um, to be really high if your heart rate is going up a lot. So you have a very high blood supply to the heart to make sure that it really never runs out of oxygen. Um, to put that in perspective, the heart is usually less than a pound in mass. It is bigger in men than in women, but it should always be, you know, less than a pound. Um, so that's a very small percentage of your total body weight, but it's accounting for 5% of all the blood flow through capillaries in your body. Uh, so it's, it's blood flow is um, very outsized compared to its actual mass. Um, the heart is also unique because it gets less blood flow during systole and more in diastole. So that's unusual. Usually, you know, blood pressure goes up in systole. That means that blood, flow fa blood flows faster in systole um, and less fast in diastole. But for the heart, when the heart is in systole, that means the muscle is contracting in the heart and those uh, coronary vessels that are traveling through that muscle will get constricted, they'll get kind of squeezed, they can actually squeeze shut almost, um, so that blood doesn't go through them as well. And then when the heart relaxes, the pressure is off and blood flows through them normally again. Um, so this can actually be uh, uh, one more danger of having a really high heart rate, in addition to uh, the possibility of your ventricles not filling all the way before the next systole. Um, since your heart doesn't receive as much flow during systole, that means that if you're having a rapid heart rate with frequent systoles, you might not have enough blood flow to your heart, um, or at least you're going to have a reduced blood flow to your heart compared to normal. Yet at that same time, you have a greater oxygen demand of the heart because it's contracting more. So um, that wouldn't you know, really affect you unless you had an extremely high heart rate, but it is a danger uh, potentially. Um, also in the heart, the perfusion is really strongly controlled by the hypoxic vasodilation or metabolic controls where if the heart is using more oxygen, it then receives more uh, perfusion. So on this image here, um, this is scans of the heart showing the perfusion. Uh, wherever you have red, white, and yellow, that's where you have the most blood flow in the heart. Um, on the bottom, you have the heart at rest, and at the top, it's during stress, which probably means that this patient was exercising when these scans were taken. And you can see that the, um, the brightly colored areas in each um, view are bigger in the resting picture and smaller in the stress picture, and thus indicating that this person's heart is receiving less blood when... Um, when they're having a rapid heart rate because they have so many systoles and the flow is reduced in systole. The brain also has a special perfusion with an unusually high, um, per, uh, unusually high blood supply. Um, the brain will be about three pounds in weight uh, and it receives about 15% of the total blood flow in the body. So that's again very outsized compared to its mass. Um, overall, the brain should always be getting about the same amount of blood. Um, it doesn't vary based on activity like it would for other organs, but that doesn't mean that all parts of the brain are getting the same amount of flow all the time. So actually, um, when you have one part of your brain activate, it's going to receive more blood flow, um, and other areas of the brain that are less active will receive less blood flow. So the flow in the, of blood in the brain is constant overall when you look at the whole brain, but when you look at specific parts of the brain, you notice that blood flow is constantly shunting you know, around in the brain from a less active area to a more active area. And you can actually um, see that in the fMRI, or functional magnetic resonance imaging. So fMRI is usually used to evaluate brain activity, but it's actually not measuring activity of the brain. It's measuring blood flow in the brain. 
it's measuring the microcirculation. So we're using this assumption that when uh, you have an area receiving more blood flow, that means it's more active to basically uh, validate the fMRI. If, if that assumption didn't hold true, then fMRI data, data would not be like useful to us the way that it is. Um, also in the brain, you have the neurons and astrocytes uh, helping to regulate microcirculation. So those would be responsible for kind of letting the capillaries know like which areas are more active and need more uh, perfusion, which areas are less active and don't need as much perfusion. The image here is an fMRI of a patient who's actually in a vegetative state, which means that they are alive and, you know, I guess for a long time it was assumed they were not conscious, but they actually are conscious in there, but they're not able to move. Um, maybe they can maybe move their eyes, but usually not even that actually. They're basically completely paralyzed and trapped inside of their uh, skulls. So for a long time we thought that these people were also kind of, you know, out of it, not really conscious, but using fMRI um, and some creative creative problem solving, we've been able to discover that they actually uh, are conscious and they do hear things and see things. They're taking in sensory information, it's just that they can't respond. So in this uh, experiment, this patient in a vegetative state was hooked up to an fMRI machine and they were told uh, to think about specific things um, as a way to answer yes or no to a question. So, you know, you ask the patient a question that has a yes or no answer and you tell them if the answer is yes, think about playing tennis. If the answer is no, think about walking around in your house. So, um, and then you also do this with a person who's, you know, normal, not in a vegetative state, you know, for a control. When a person thinks about playing tennis, you see uh, motor areas activating in the brain. And for the control healthy patient, it's basically the same as for the vegetative patient. Um, when you ask the person to think about moving around in their house, the spatial areas of their brain will activate. And you can see it's pretty similar between the control healthy patient and the vegetative patient. Well, I guess the control patient isn't a patient, is it, are they? They're a subject. <laughs> uh, but the vegetative state patient has basically similar uh, pattern of brain activity when they're thinking about moving around their house uh, compared to a healthy control. So you can actually use this uh, to communicate with those people. Skeletal muscle also has an unusual perfusion um, because it varies very widely between when the muscle is at rest and when it is activated during exercise. So skeletal muscle has very low demand for oxygen at rest but a very high demand for oxygen when it's contracting and using a lot of ATP. And so it has a blood supply during exercise that matches that oxygen demand. Um, when the blood supply for uh, mus skeletal muscle is increasing, you have um, first the smallest arterioles dilating, then the bigger ones, then the biggest ones, then the actual arteries that serve that muscle dilating. When the muscle is at rest, all of those vessels are constricting to reduce the blood flow to the muscle. And you have some special names for the arteries and arterial serving muscle. So the smallest artery that will serve a skeletal muscle is called the feed artery. Then you have um, arterioles branching off of that and smaller arterioles branching off of them. And then you end up at the terminal arterioles, which are the arterioles that lead into each capillary bed in the muscle, in the skeletal muscle. So those terminal arterioles are the ones that are going to dilate first when the muscle becomes activated. Then you'll have um, the next largest arterioles dilate, then the largest arterioles will dilate, then finally the feed artery itself will dilate. Every time a bigger vessel dilates, more blood is supplied to the muscle. Um, interestingly, insulin actually has been found to enhance this, um, to enhance this effect. Um, and if you don't get exercise, if you have a sedentary lifestyle, um, that's actually been noticed to increase insulin resistance or insulin insensitivity, which is the basis for type 2 diabetes. So it's not exactly clear what's going on there, but it does seem clear that 
exercise will help you um, kind of work with your insulin, um, be sensitive to insulin. It increases insulin sensitivity um, and avoid type 2 diabetes. Finally, the skin is the last organ that has a really unusual um, perfusion. Um, the perfusion in the skin varies from almost none or basically none to quite a lot, uh, mostly in response to temperature. Every capillary bed in the skin also has a special anastomosis that allows it to be bypassed entirely, which of course would reduce perfusion dramatically. Um, you have most of the control of perfusion in the skin being uh, done by the sympathetic nervous system. And after that, autoregulation has a noticeable effect. The autoregulation is going to be um, primarily uh, based on temperature changes. The sympathetic nervous system will be regulating skin perfusion uh, in response to temperature, but also um, reducing it when you're exercising or uh, just any time you have a really strong sympathetic nervous system activation, so when you're in some sort of emergency or state of crisis, which is why you may be pale at those times. So here's an example of cap a capillary bed in the skin. You have the arterial leading into it, the venule leading away from it. This is the capillary bed itself. This would be your uh, central vessel or the central channel. And then here's that special anastomosis. So when this anastomosis is dilated, um, it's actually going to be much larger in diameter than the, cap than the capillaries themselves, which means that blood is going to travel through the anastomosis and skip the capillary bed, just going straight from the arterial down the anastomosis and back to the venule. <coughs> The arterial and venule and the anastomosis itself will be kind of deeper in the skin Then the capillary bed is very close to the surface of the skin, just under the epithelium itself, actually. So whenever you're cold, um, it's good to restrict blood flow in the skin because you will lose heat um, from that blood. So you want the blood to be flowing deeper in the skin and farther away from the surface. So in cold conditions, um, autoregulation and or the sympathetic nervous system will dilate this anastomosis and you're going to be shunting blood away from that capillary bed, keeping it deep within the skin so that you can preserve your body heat better. The opposite thing happens if it's very warm um, or hot, that anastomosis is going to constrict in response to autoregulation or uh, sympathetic nervous system control. When it's constricted, you're not going to have very much blood flow through it that blood is gonna start flowing through the capillary bed instead, which is gonna take it right up close to the surface of the skin. And then the heat from the blood is gonna radiate out uh, to the environment from that blood. So when the sympathetic nervous system activates, of course, that's gonna vasoconstrict uh, vessels in the skin, including those anastomoses, so you'll have less perfusion of the skin um, that occurs when it's cold, also when you're exercising or during an emergency, any time uh, that you have a strong SNS activation, that effect will occur, um, which is why you look pale in the cold. And then when it's hot, you will have the sympathetic nervous system not active, at least not active um, in the skin itself, so that you're going to have a lot of blood flowing through that capillary bed and your skin will look uh, redder than, than normal. It's, it'll look flushed due to all the blood flowing through it. So now we'll talk about water moving across the capillary walls. Um, this is driven by a pressure gradient that exists between um, the fluid inside the, uh, inside the capillaries and the fluid outside the capillaries, and it's also um, impacted by osmosis. So you have hydrostatic pressure that's affecting water exchange and the osmotic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure just means um, the pressure or force exerted by a fluid on the walls of its container. So your blood is a fluid in the inside of a container, which is your blood vessels. Um, so you have a capillary hydrostatic pressure, which just means your blood pressure inside the capillaries. But also the tissue uh, has water in it, 
that um, acts like water in a container, a very large container, and you're going to have that interstitial or tissue hydrostatic pressure pushing um, on the walls of the blood vessels from the outside. Um, so you have those two different uh, opposed hydrostatic pressures affecting how water moves across the capillary walls. Both the pressure of the fluid in the tissue pushing onto the capillary walls and the pressure of um, the blood inside of the capillary pushing on, pushing on the capillary walls. And remember that blood pressure of the fluid inside the capillaries um, is higher on the arterial end and smaller on the venule end of the capillary. So it varies from end to end. Um, in addition to that, you have the osmotic pressure affecting water exchange. Osmotic pressure is defined as the force that you need to prevent osmosis. So how hard you need to press on a liquid to prevent water from moving into it by osmosis. And you have an example right here. Um, so here you have water contained in a U-shaped container with a membrane at the very bottom of it, at the perfect middle, that is permeable um, but not to water. So these little yellow balls are supposed to be the water here, uh, and the blue, the bigger blue balls are a solute. So one side of this U has just um, the water, and the other side of the U has a solution of water with that solute dissolved in it, Maybe it's sugar, it's probably sugar. Um, water is able to move across this membrane, but the solute cannot move. That means that you're gonna have osmosis occurring. If the solute was able to cross this membrane, then you would not have osmosis. You would just have the solute diffusing across the membrane until the solute concentration was equal on one side of the U and uh, versus the other side of the U. Since that solute can't cross the membrane, water is gonna move by osmosis instead. Water will always be attracted to the compartment that has more solutes. So in this case, your pure water is attracted to the side of the U that has the solute in it. That's the side with more solutes. So water will be moving by osmosis into this um, other side of the U, and you're going to end up with more and more total volume of liquid on this side of the U um, until eventually the concentration of water on each side of the U or each side of the membrane is equal. So osmotic pressure is how hard you would have to push down on this, uh, this liquid, on this side of the U that has a solute in it, to prevent any water from moving into it at all and keep the volume um, back at the, at the starting level. So you have, uh, just like you have two hydrostatic pressures, you also have two osmotic pressures at work here. You have the capillary osmotic pressure that's caused by all the solutes inside of the capillaries. Um, so water is attracted into the capillaries by those solutes. The main one would be albumin. You also have the interstitial osmotic pressure, which is the osmotic pressure of the tissues around the capillaries. That's uh, all the solutes in those tissues are attracting water out of the capillaries into the tissue. So capillary, uh, the capillary hydrostatic pressure, which is the blood pressure in the capillaries, the interstitial hydrostatic pressure, the capillary osmotic pressure, and the interstitial osmotic pressure all interact with each other to create the pressure gradient that drives capillary water exchange. So here, this, is, this diagram is kind of summarizing all of those. This capillary filtration pressure, what they mean there is just the blood pressure of the capillaries. So that is the, the blood pushing on the walls of the vessel, kind of pushing water out. Then you also have the tissue uh, hydrostatic pressure, which is the same as the interstitial hydrostatic pressure. That's the fluid in the tissues pushing onto the walls of the vessel, pushing water into the vessel. Then on the other side, you have the osmotic pressures. Um, you have the capillary osmotic pressure, which you could also call the capillary colloidal osmotic pressure. Um, and we'll go over the colloidal bit in a, in a moment here. That osmotic pressure is created by all the solutes inside the blood. It's pooling water into the vessel. And then finally, you have the tissue osmotic pressure or the tissue colloidal pressure, same thing, uh, which is all the solutes in the tissue pooling water out of the blood into the tissue. Um, 
So each of those is opposed to the other, right? The two hydrostatic pressures are pointing opposite ways and the two osmotic pressures are pointing opposite ways. So they're gonna cancel each other out to some extent and depending on which ones are stronger, that'll determine whether, cap uh, whether water is leaving the capillaries or entering the capillaries. And then finally, it's important to remember that your capillary blood pressure is higher on the arterial end and lower on the venous end of the capillary. And that's going to affect whether water moves in or out on each end of the capillary. So um, I guess some of this I already went over on osmosis, but osmosis is only going to happen if your solutes uh, cannot cross into the other compartment, if they can't cross the membrane or if they can't cross the vessel wall. Um, for most of the things dissolved in the blood, they actually will be able to cross the capillary wall, which means most of the solutes in the plasma do not contribute to osmosis or to the osmotic pressure of the blood itself. Um, only the ones that cannot cross the vessel wall will be contributing. Uh, the main one of those is gonna be albumin. It's just too big to cross the vessel wall. Um, also, it's so big that it's not really dissolved in the blood, uh, which means that the solution of albumin in the blood is called a colloid. A colloid is, I mean, it's not really a true solution, I guess, because uh, the solute isn't really dissolved, so it's not really a solute. Um, a colloid is a mixture of a liquid and something, some particles or molecules suspended in it that are suspended there, but they are not actually dissolved. Um, the most common example of a colloid that people are familiar with is milk. Milk is a colloid because all the proteins in the milk are not really dissolved. They're just kind of evenly distributed and suspended throughout, uh, throughout the water of the milk. You can tell the difference between a solution, a true solution, and a colloid by shining light through it. If you shine light through a true solution, you will not see the light beam passing through. If you shine light through a colloid, you will see it passing through. It's bouncing off of all those particles that are not really dissolved in there. They're just suspended in the colloid. So your blood is a colloid because of the albumin and some of the other big proteins in it, but albumin is really the main one. So albumin is the main contributor to the osmotic pressure of your blood. Um, we have a term colloid osmotic pressure or the oncotic pressure. It could be called either one. That term takes into account all of the osmotic pressure forces that are, work, that are at work here. So that's both the osmotic pressure of the blood and the osmotic pressure of the tissues or the interstitial osmotic pressure. Uh, we can abbreviate the oncotic pressure as OP. So in order to find the oncotic pressure, you would take the blood osmotic pressure and subtract the interstitial osmotic pressure. And the blood osmotic pressure, osmotic pressure again, is going to be mostly, mostly due to albumin, how much albumin is in the blood. More albumin means more osmotic pressure, less albumin, less albumin means less osmotic pressure in the blood. So if we put all of these terms together, we'll get the net filtration pressure, which is the total force um, that is causing water to enter or leave the capillary uh, once all these different forces are taken into account. So you can simplify all of that to the net filtration pressure or NFP equals the blood pressure minus the OP or the oncotic pressure. So the oncotic pressure is, always, is already accounting for both of the osmotic forces that are at work here. Um, then we have the blood pressure, which is the capillary uh, hydrostatic pressure. Um, and then the interstitial pressure, the interstitial hydrostatic pressure, we're just leaving that out of the equation because for most tissues, it's very, very small. It should be basically zero. It's gonna be a little bit more than zero, technically speaking, but it's so small compared to the other pressures that we can really just ignore it in most cases. If you have a lot of swelling, that situation might change. Uh, but in general, it's about zero. On the arterial end of the capillary, you have a higher blood pressure. On the venial end of the capillary, you have a lower blood pressure. So that means that the NFP is going to be higher on the arterial end and lower on the venial end. The oncotic pressure will be the same throughout the whole capillary. Um, for most capillaries, on the arterial end, the NFP is going to be around 13 millim millimeters of mercury. Uh, millimeters of mercury. 
Um, since that's a positive number, water is going to be pushed out of the capillaries overall. Um, so water will be leaving the capillaries on the arterial end. On the venial end, where you have the lower blood pressure, the NFP is going to be lower. Actually, it's going to be negative 7 millimeters of mercury, roughly, uh, for most capillaries. Uh, but it should be uh, less than zero for all the capillaries. Which means that on the venial end of every capillary, water is going to be returning into the blood from the tissue. Um, so on the arterial end, you lose some water. As you progress along this um, capillary, you're gonna have the blood pressure decreasing steadily. So the amount of water that's leaving is gonna go down and down and down until actually the amount of water that's leaving is smaller than the amount of water that's being drawn back in by osmosis. By, the, by that oncotic pressure. So at the venual end, you're actually sucking water from the tissues back into the bloodstream, back into the capillary, which is important. If you are losing water on the arterial end but not putting it back on the venual end, you're gonna run out of blood volume um, relatively quickly, actually. Um, you still do end up losing some volume Overall, you're going to have more fluid uh, leaving on the uh, arterial end than what comes back on the venial end. If it was like 13 uh, millimeters of mercury on the arterial end and negative 13 on the venial end, then it would be equal. But it's 13 and then negative 7. So more goes out than what comes back in. Overall, every day, um, depending, you know, depending on how fast your blood is moving and all, but it should, and how much blood volume you have in your body to start with, but, and how many capillaries you have, so how big you are. Um, so it depends on a variety of things, but overall per day, you should be losing, losing um, two to four liters of water every day um, that are coming out of your capillaries and not going back in. So that's a lot. Uh, that's like most of your blood volume right there. Um, that's not that's not gonna work. <laughs> that's not gonna work for you. You're gonna run out of blood volume and and enter shock and die if you don't have uh, some way of fixing that issue. Um, so what your body does to fix it is use the lymphatic uh, system and the lymph vessels. So next to every capillary bed, you're gonna have some lymphatic uh, capillaries that are collecting that extra water that came out of the blood and it's gonna flow through the lymphatic vessels, and ultimately, those are all gonna drain into the inferior vena cava. So all that um, fluid that's leaving uh, the capillaries, going into the tissues, is getting picked up by the lymph, by the lymph vessels, it goes to make the lymph, and it comes back, ultimately, to the veins. Um, if you have swelling, if you have uh, water leaving those capillaries that is not collected by the lymph vessels and returned to the veins, that's going to cause swelling. The name for that uh, medically is edema. Um, usually edema is going to happen in the legs because of gravity basically pulling the extra fluid down there. Um, there's a number of conditions that will cause edema. Of course, anytime you have like an injury that can cause edema, as you have inflammation, that's going to cause swelling of the tissues. Um, but also other conditions, if you have hypertension, um, the increased blood pressure is going to end up pushing out more water from the, uh, from the capillaries and more water than actually can be collected by the lymph vessels. So you'll end up with edema um, if it gets kind of bad. You could also have sometimes something blocking your lymph vessels. Uh, if that happens, you're also going to end up with edema. Um, various circulatory problems and heart failure will also cause edema. Um, as blood is not flowing properly, you're going to end up with more kind of leaving the capillaries and not being collected. Uh, also, if you have liver damage, and that's because albumin is produced in the liver. If you don't have enough albumin, then you don't have enough oncotic pressure. The blood doesn't have as, as much osmotic pressure. The tissues are going to end up maybe with more or at least with too much. Um, so the oncotic pressure is going to drop. You're not attracting water back into the blood without that album in there to attract it, uh, which means that overall you're going to end up with swelling.